Okay, we begin this morning se session with uh, Manuel Ritore from uh, University of Granada. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so the problem I would like, uh, oh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity to talk here. And uh, the problem I would like to talk today is a, a variational problem. Uh, it's a quite classical variational problem. We just want to uh, classify the critical points of uh, some area, functional, in some manifold. So, uh, the problem at first glance could seem a bit um, uh, artificial. But let me explain first why this problem appears, so that you can convince yourself that the problem is really interesting, because of its many, of, of, uh, its many applications to some other areas. So uh, the variational problem I would like to consider comes from uh, vision theory. Okay, so um, the motivation for, to study this problem is perceptual completion. So uh, our visual system tends to complete contours. For instance, this is a classical example by uh, uh, Katsura, sure. sorry, Kanitsa. So um, we have this image, and when we see this image, then we don't see a connected set, black set. We see two different objects that are, I mean, interlaced. So our visual system tend to complete this contour. So in principle, we have here a line. We can interpret this uh, black area as a hole in the image. So our visual system tends to complete this uh, this line okay so of course uh, it's also done in this this way so how how does uh, our visual system works okay we uh, receive we perceive uh, stimuli through our eyes in the retina and uh, at every position of the retina we have a stack of cells that are arranged in hypercolumns so any of these cells is uh, specialized, has a different uh, purpose. Some of them uh, detects uh, orientation, orientation of contours. Some others uh, detect uh, curvature, the curvature of the contours. And so uh, one can model, one can make simple models thinking into account these variables. One can uh, model the visual system by using uh, Carnot manifolds structure. So there are several models taking into account all these variables. Perhaps the simplest model consists simply on taking the position in the retina and the orientation of the contour. So in this way, this way we have a three-dimensional manifold. This is the simplest model, is the Chitty Sarti model. So we consider here the retinal plane is R2, and we add a variable representing a direction, a direction of contours. So the underlying manifold here is simply the product, the uh, Euclidean product of the retinal plane times the unit sphere, which represents the space of directions. So this is the rototranslational group, and on this group we consider this contact form. This contact form uh, has the property that any curve that uh, whose tangent vector lies in the kernel corresponds to a curve that, when projected, has a variable theta that is equal to the angle that makes the projected vector on the retinal plane. So when we have a curve in the retinal plane and we lift this curve so that it's tangent to the kernel of this one form, okay, then what we have is precisely this, these curves. Lifting of curves naturally lie in the kernel of this one, one form. Okay, so uh, this is a contact manifold. One can, can consider a basis of this uh, plane, a family of planes. And so any curve in the retinal plane uh, okay, is, is lifted this way. And um, an image, from the mathematical point of view, is simply a surface in this manifold that is foliated by horizontal curves. And the horizontal curves are the contours of the image. Okay, so this is the mathematical model. So uh, 
the rib vector field associated to this contact manifold is this one, and we can take a Riemannian metric making this uh, x, y, and t basis orthonormal. So, for a general surface in the uh, roto translational group of degree 3, we can consider, which is expressed as the graph of this function, we can consider this uh, area. This area is obtained as the limit of uh, scale Riemannian areas. <coughs> the metric here is simply a family of approximating Riemannian metrics. This metric coincides with uh, the original one in x and y, so in the horizontal plane. But the vector t, which is uh, transversal to the plane, is multiplied by 1 over r. So when r goes to 0, the length of t goes to infinity. Okay? This way, when we approach uh, the... Uh, when we make r tends to 0, we have a family of metric spaces the metrics are the, the distances are the ones associated to the Riemannian metric that in hausdorff gromov sense converge to a, uh, a structure, to a sub Riemannian structure. Okay? So what happens if we consider a surface in this family of Riemannian manifolds and we pass to the limit this way? This way we obtain some functional, some area functional that is given precisely by this, uh, this quantity. Okay? And this, uh, this functional uh, measures, in some sense, the cost of uh, interpolating an image when we have holes. So, if we have an image and we have some uh, holes inside the image, we can try to reconstruct this image. This functional, in some sense, tend to minimize the cost of uh, interpolating this image. Okay, so this is an area functional, and uh, if we think of this vector, recall that the vector x is this one. So this should be the unit normal, sorry, the tangent uh, vector to a given curve lifted to the to the distribution. So if we think of this vector as the tangent vector to the projected curve, and we think of u as the uh, angle theta then this is the tangent derivative of, of the angle theta. So this is a curvature of the projected curve. So essentially, this uh, quantity is equal to the curvature of the projected curve. So this way, the area can be interpreted this way. And this is related to Masnou model, see also uh, Ambrosio Masnou model, for reconstructed contours images. The classical way, a classical way of reconstructing, reconstructing an image is, uh, suppose you have an image and you have, you have some contours. So you remove a piece of the image. So you want to interpolate the contours. So this way you have some curves, but at some point you remove part of the image. So how do you reconstruct this contour? Usually by interpolating by elastica. which are the critical points of this functional. Okay? So this way, uh, this model allows us to reconstruct image by simply solving a plateau problem. Plateau problem consists of uh, finding minimal surfaces with a given boundary. So suppose we have an image which is a surface in the roto translational group. And suppose we have a hole in this image, a gap in this image. So we want to reconstruct this image. How do we do it? We consider this area functional that minimizes the cost of interpolating the image with this boundary data. These boundary data are the known values of the image. And then we consider a minimal surface uh, with this boundary data. So this is a pl really a plateau problem. Okay? The degree, uh, I'm going to explain what is the degree along the, along the talk. Essentially, essentially depends on the position of the tangent plane of the surface with respect to the distribution we are getting. Okay? So in this case, uh, a vector in the horizontal distribution has degree 1, and a vector outside has degree 2. And the degree of the surface is the sum of the degrees of the tangent planes. So in general, the tangent plane is the tangent plane at uh, 
uh, most points is not contained in the horizontal distribution, so it has a transversal position. So it has one tangent vector to the to the uh, horizontal distribution and another one that is not contained. So one plus two is degree three. Okay. Okay, that's a very very interesting question. Depends on the manifold. In general, when you have a contact manifold, then uh, you put a sublimania metric in the horizontal distribution, and then it's very easy to extend this metric to a Riemannian metric in a canonical form, simply by getting the rip vector field and saying that you are you have a, a modulus one and you are orthogonal to the horizontal distribution. So in contact manifolds, uh, really. It doesn't depend on the extension if you do this extension, <laughs> okay? But in general, it, it does depend on the extension, okay? Okay, so I, I will mention some uh, more things about this, okay? So, um, of course, uh, you can consider the in the chitty sarti model, you can consider as variables the position in the retinal plane and the uh, orientation of the curve. But you can also add Another parameter that is the curvature, the curvature of the of the planar curve. Okay, so this way you have a four-dimensional manifold, and uh, you have to impose uh, some conditions, because uh, when you have a curve in this four-dimensional manifold, this uh, in principle is not the lifting of a planar curve in the x1 plane. So if you want to uh, lift a curve, the curve has to lie in the two-dimensional distribution defined by these two uh, one forms, okay? So essentially lifting of curves to this two-dimensional uh, distribution projected again to the retinal plane provides the same curve, okay? So here uh, we have this distribution, here you ha we have a two-dimensional distribution when we take the first order, the first Lie brackets, then we have an additional vector field, and when we take twice the Lie brackets, then we have another vector field. So in this way we have a change of distributions, H2, which is a planar distribution, H1, which is a planar distribution, H2, which is uh, H1 plus the span of this vector field, and uh, H3, which is uh, the whole tangent bundle to, bundle to the manifold. Okay, so this way, again, an image is a surface of this type contained in this four-dimensional manifold, okay? And again, we want to build, we want to construct a, a measure, a, in some sense, representing the cost of uh, uh, filling gaps inside the image. So uh, here, in principle, we could have several choices. Because in principle, we could have several Riemannian metrics, uh, well, extending the canonical metric in the horizontal distribution. But the most promising one seems to be uh, the one that makes uh, partial of x, partial of y, partial of theta, and partial of k uh, uh, purely Euclidean. So this way, if we repeat the process, then we have this cost functional in this way. But again, let me remark that this area is obtained as a limit of Riemannian areas, but uh, weighted by its own exponent. And this weight depends on the degree of the surface. In this case, the surface has degree 4, because one tangent vector is contained in the horizontal distribution, and so it has degree 1, and the other one is contained in the whole tangent plane in the whole tangent space, but is not contained in the intermediate uh, distribution. So we have a vector of uh, degree 1 and another one of degree 3, so we have degree 4. So for these surfaces, we can use this functional. Please compare this functional that is uh, similar but different to the one we attained before, okay? So here we measure uh, uh, 1 plus the curvature square plus the derivative of the curvature square, okay? Okay, so uh, in short, uh, we want to measure some, some manifolds by using an area functional that comes from uh, Riemannian approximations, but also depends on the degree of the submanifold. Okay? 
So, uh, minimize, to minimize this area measure is quite important for the mathematical models of vision that we have stated. And in general, if we add much more and more variables, then in principle we could have different functionals. So, it would be interesting to have a kind of general theory or at least general methods to try to treat these, uh, these kind of problems. Okay. Okay, so this is simply the, the motivation. So, um, what is known from the mathematical point of view in this, for these problems? Uh, Condimension one, uh, surfaces in Carnot group has been uh, widely studied. In this case, we have uh, the classical Subriemannian perimeter, but as I have mentioned, the uh, uh, contact case, the condimension one case, is slightly easier in some sense, in contact manifold. And in Carnot groups, we have the notion of perimeter. So, okay, we have a, th this is not a special difficult case. Okay, in high, higher condimension, Frankie Serapioni and Saracassano uh, gave some notions of uh, area for these submanifolds. Indeed, they, they, uh, they gave uh, different types of uh, definitions, different, two different definitions for, for the area of these submanifolds, okay, that they do not coincide in some cases. Okay, the degree of submanifolds in Carnot group has been studied by um, Magnani and Bitone, just in Carnot groups. Uh, in this paper, it's clear that the role of the Riemannian metric is essential. In the sense that this is not really a sub Riemannian problem. The Riemannian metric is very important here. Okay. And uh, the house of dimension of a uh, uh, problem of relating uh, how is related our measure to the house of measure or house of dimension related to the sub Riemannian metric. This has been studied by uh, uh, Magnana and Bitone in uh, Carnot groups for the whole manifold and for some manifolds for Gessi and Yen. Okay, okay so um, let me start by defining what is a Carnot manifold. A Carnot manifold is simply a manifold, a smooth manifold. We are assuming that all the objects are smooth. This means C infinity. Probably the regularity of the critical points is going to be much lower. But uh, as a starting point, let me, let me consider uh, a smoothness of, of all the objects I am considering. Okay, so uh, a Carnot manifold is simply a, a smooth manifold uh, with a distribution that satisfies Hormander uh, rank condition. This means that uh, along the distribution, uh, the vector fields uh, defining locally the distribution generate uh, the Lie algebra at that point. In a finite number of steps, then um, computing Lie brackets and adding these vector fields, we get uh, the whole uh, uh, tangent uh, space to the to the manifold. Okay, so a Carnot manifold is simply a smooth and dimensional manifold, together with a distribution of dimension k. K is fixed at every point, satisfying Hormander's rank condition. Okay, so uh, there is a classical theorem by Cho that uh, uh, states that if, uh, uh, if we have a Carnot manifold, then every two points can be joined, if it is connected, every two points can be joined by a horizontal curve. A curve who, whose uh, tangent vector is contained in the horizontal distribution. Okay, so uh, a fundamental hypothesis in when uh, looking at Carnot manifolds is uh, the one of equiregularity. Equiregularity means essentially that when we make at every point all these iterated distributions, then we have a constant dimension for all this uh, set. This is uh, warranted in Carnot groups because of the left invariance of the of the distribution. Usually, in a Carnot group, you you put a left invariant distribution. So when you take Lie brackets, then you have automatically that uh, all these distributions at points are uh, invariant in some sense by left translations. So uh, in Carnot groups, we have this uh, for granted. Okay, but in general, some Riemannian manifolds we don't have. Okay, um, when we have an, uh, the fundamental result for equiregular Carnot manifolds is that uh, near given points, almost everywhere, we can scale up these manifolds. So in the limit, what we get is a Carnot group, okay, by Mitchell's theorem. 
So, carnot groups in some sense are like the uh, tangent spaces to equiregular uh, subdomenia, equiregular carnot manifolds. Okay. Okay, so finally let me define the degree of a, of a, of a vector. Okay, we have, when we have the, the Carnot manifold, we have a change of distribution. Each one is obtained from the uh, previous one simply by taking Lie brackets, okay, this way. So, uh, in a finite number of steps, S is called the step of the manifold, we reach the whole tangent bundle. So, uh, we say that a vector in the tangent space to a point yeah, in the manifold has degree L if uh, this vector belongs to the L uh, component of the change of distribution, but not to the L minus one. Okay? So, in particular, if we have a change of three uh, distributions. Like in the second case we have considered, if, the, if we have a vector here and a vector here, the vector here but is not here, then a vector here has degree 1 and a vector here that is not here has degree 3. Okay, so um, the homogeneous dim dimension of an equiregular Carnot manifold is simply given by this, uh, this property. Okay? okay, so what's the degree of a sum manifold? Suppose you have a Carnot manifold and a local adapted basis. Basis. What is a local adapted basis? It's a basis that is obtained by choosing a base here, extending this base to a base here, extending this one to a base here, so that the degree of the adapted basis is increasing. We can reorder the vectors so that the first n1 vectors has degree one the next n2 minus n1 plus 1 vectors has degree 2 and so on. So this uh, is an adapted basis around a point. We can, uh, in, in a Carnot group we can do it globally but in a, in a Carnot manifold this can be done in the neighborhood of every point. So uh, we can choose a basis of m vectors uh, simply by making uh, m uh, wedge products of the vectors we are taking here. So we can define the degree of a um, simple n vector this way simply by adding the degrees of these uh, of these vector fields. Okay. So in particular, uh, if we have a family of n vectors tangent to the uh, to the manifold at the point P. Then we can express this vector as a linear combination of uh, this basis we have here. Okay, so the degree of this vector is simply the maximum of the degree of these n vectors for which the coordinate is different from zero. Okay, so the degree is defined as a maximum. For instance, if we add two degree two vectors, then the degree of the sum is less than or equal. We have the usual properties. Okay. If we have an n vector and we multiply this vector by lambda, then if lambda is different from zero, we have the same degree, and if lambda is zero, then we have degree zero, and so on. No, because when you make a change, then you see that the coordinates, there is a change of coordinates, so that the coefficients you have here then are different from zero. Okay? It is not a problem. It's, I mean, it's, it's not a a nice task to do, but is uh, okay. Okay, so um, essentially, when you take two different uh, local adapted bas bases, then everything works well. I mean, it, uh, n n nothing depends. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The point is that when you choose two adapted bases, then the degree is preserved in some sense. And when you make the, I mean, the change of variables, then everything works uh, quite well. Okay, so uh, we can define the degree of an m vector this way by this maximum. So we can define the degree of a manifold simply as by taking a, a basis of the tangent plane to the sum manifold and computing the degree of this vector field. Again, this doesn't depend on the basis you choose on the sum manifold. Because if you choose a different one, then you have a, a change of, uh, there is a mat mat matrix relating the coordinates of both uh, bases and the determinant is different from zero. So again, you have a uh, same degree. Okay. 
So, um, the degree at a given point for a sum manifold is defined this way. You choose a basis at this point and then you take the maximum of these degrees. And now you can define the degree of the sum manifold by taking the maximum of the degrees at every point. So, in principle, if you have a manifold of degree d, then you may have points of degree d, but you also can have points of degree less than or equal to t. Okay? For instance, if you are, consider the case where you are in the Heisenberg group. And suppose you have a hypersurface contained in the Heisenberg group. Okay? So, um, you have points uh, in this hypersurface where the tangent plane is horizontal, is contained in the horizontal distribution. So, and in these points, these points are usually called S0, this is the singular set. Then the singular set is composed of the points where the tangent plane is uh, precisely the horizontal distribution. If we choose a basis here, then every vector in this basis has degree 1. So, since the uh, topological dimension of the Heisenberg group is 2m plus 1, then this has dimension 2m. So, uh, if p belongs to sigma naught, then the degree of sigma at p is 2n. Because we can choose a basis so that every vector is tangent to the horizontal distribution, so it has degree 1 and we have 2n vectors, so we add up and we get this one. But if we pick a point that is not in the, in the singular set, then the tangent plane to this uh, uh, hypersurface intersect the horizontal distribution in a 2 in a 2n minus 1 space. We can choose a bas basis in this space, so adding up we have this degree, but we have also another vector that is not in the horizontal distribution. So this vector has degree 2. So this is the degree for any point which is not here, which is of course 2n plus 1. So if we pick a hypersurface in the Heisenberg group, then singular points have degree 2n and non-singular point has degree 2n plus 1. Okay? So in general, uh, the degree is not constant for a sum manifold of degree d, the degree is not con constant along the surface, but achieves its maximum at this, uh, at this quantity, at this point. Okay, the degree can be computed, this is a computation by Gromov, the degree can be computed simply by intersecting the, intersecting the uh, su successive distributions with the tangent plane and computing the dimension. So, we have this property. Okay, so this can be checked, it's not uh, too difficult to do. For instance, this way, uh, the sigma naught intersected with the horizontal distribution has exactly this dimension, and this has uh, dimension 1. So here we have 2n plus 1 plus 2 times 1, so we have exactly this formula. Okay. So the degree of the sum of a sum manifold really what measures is how the tangent uh, space to the to the sum manifold interacts with the uh, horizontal distribution and the successive distribution we obtain by making brackets. Okay, so let me call <coughs> in analogy with the Heisenberg case. Let me call the singular set as the points of the sum manifold with degree strictly smaller than the degree of the sum manifold. Okay. So this is the, the example I have just mentioned, and a very important property is that the degree is lower semi-continuous. Okay? If we have a sequence of points here in this hypersurface, then either uh, converge, for instance, here regular point, then either they converge to a regular point or to a singular point. In any case, the degree of the limit point is smaller than or equal to the degree of the, of the sequence. Okay? Okay, so uh, finally, to define the, the, the functional, the area functional we are going to treat, let me consider an approximating sequence of Riemannian manifolds. Okay, so consider a Carnot manifold, fix a Riemannian metric G, and define uh, these uh, 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 vector spaces lie in this way. In the first case, we take the horizontal distribution, then we take the orthogonal to the horizontal distribution intersected with H2, 
then we take the orthogonal to this distribution intersected with H3. And so we can decompose the tangent bundle to the manifold this way. This is an orthogonal decomposition, okay, because we are using orthogonality here to define this, uh, this uh, set. So we can define a family of Riemannian metrics so that these spaces are still orthogonal for any R. For the original Riemannian metric, these subspaces are orthogonal. Okay, so for any R, let me define a Riemannian metric so that the subspaces are still orthogonal, but the Riemannian metric is modified by this constant on any of these subspaces. For instance, if we take uh, I equal to one, then this is zero. So the metric is unmodified in the horizontal distribution. In the second layer, in H2, which corresponds to K, uh, kappa 2, then we have 1 over R times G, and so on. Okay. So um, this uh, sequence of Riemannian metrics is quite classical, and it's known that uh, the metric spaces associated to these Riemannian manifolds converge in Hausdorff-Gromov of Hausdorff sense to the metric space associated to this Riemannian manifold. We simply restrict the metric to the horizontal distribution, okay? We consider the Carnot Carnot Theodori distance, and we have a convergence of the metric structures in this case. Okay, so uh, the problem is uh, how to define an AD area functional, okay? So let me check what happens when I consider a surface as a manifold in the Carnot manifold, okay? So let me consider this uh, any <coughs> some manifold S in N, and let me compute the area of this some manifold with respect to the Riemannian metric GR. And let me check what happens. What do I get when I when I consider this metric? Okay. Okay. So uh, fix the equiregular Carnot manifold, fix the Riemannian metric consider an immersion, and then uh, fix a Riemannian metric mu on M tilde. Mu is usually the pullback of uh, G, but it can, you can use any, any fixed Riemannian metric on the, on the submanifold. Okay, so fix an uh, orthonormal basis for the metric mu on the tangent space to the submanifold. And then uh, consider the images by the, the differential of the immersion, and then write this vector field as a linear combination of the uh, uh, simple vector fields associated to a local adaptive basis. This is a point-wise computation. You pick a point P, you pick a neighborhood in the image of this point, and then you fix a local adaptive basis. So you have this expression. Okay. So in general, uh, when you want to compute the area of uh, some manifold for uh, using a Riemannian metric, you use this formula with G simply, okay? So th this is just the area formula. If you want to compute uh, this uh, area for any Riemannian metric, you simply replace the Riemannian metric, okay? Okay, so the point is that uh, here uh, you have a G orthonormal adapted basis. So you want to produce a GR orthonormal adapted basis. You want to produce these simple vector fields, and you want to compute this decomposition in terms of this new uh, vector. Okay, so uh, because of the choice, because of the way we have defined the metric, the Riemannian metric GR, then simply by multiplying these uh, vectors by this quantity, then X, Y here is missing, okay? So by considering the, uh, and uh, this is a fraction, so this is R to the one half, okay, of this quantity. So if you multiply these vectors by this quantity for fixed R, you get a rim, an orthonormal uh, basis for the metric GR, okay? So by using these vectors, X, Y is missing here, you can produce the uh, um, vectors X, J, R, tilde, which are the N vectors corresponding to this, uh, to this quantity, okay? So at the end what you get is when you add up all these things, then when you add the degrees of the vector fields, you get the degree of the N vector, X, J. And when you uh, add uh, minus one M times, 
then you get the dimension of the sum manifold. Okay? So really you have uh, this decomposition. You can write this like uh, Tjr tilde times xjr. So this is equal. You know exactly what was the value of the uh, m vector you put here. So you pass everything to the other side. So at the end what you get is that Tjr tilde is equal to this quantity without the square. So at the end, when you add up, you get all these uh, these things. Okay. So this is the 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 value. This is the value of the Jacobian or the square Jacobian computed with respect to the metric GR. And as you see, it depends on a power of R. Okay. So if you compute the Jacobian, then if you compute uh, this area, then the reason why you put this quantity here, you are assuming that the degree of M is fixed. The reason why you are putting this quantity here is because when you multiply, then if you don't want to get negative terms here, this is in the maximum value you have to use. Okay? Because this is the, the degree of M is the maximum value that these uh, vectors can achieve. And then when you multiply by this quantity, which is the bigger one you can uh, uh, you have in this in this formula, then the remaining terms, the remaining terms becomes uh, uh, R to a positive exponent. Okay? So when you pass to the limit when R goes to zero, the limit is also missing here, then you obtain precisely this quantity. So this is the precisely the value of the uh, area of degree D for a sum manifold of dimension M. You have to multiply, you have to rescale. Okay? So this is, in my opinion, this is quite uh, interesting. If you want to give a good definition of an um, uh, area, Sarimanian area, so then if you want to to see, uh, okay, an, an obvious property should be that the, the limit areas should be the limit of the Riemannian areas of the approximating surfaces. Okay, so if you pick a, the Riemannian approximating uh, manifolds, and if you pick a fixed sum manifold, then when you pass to the limit, you want to have something uh, that behaves well. I think this is the right way to do this, but as you can see, it depends not only on the dimension of the manifold, it depends also on the degree of the manifold. So depending on the, on the degree of the sum manifold, you have different areas. So indeed if you have a surface of degree 1, and a, uh, sorry, a surface of degree 2 and a surface of degree 3, then the areas are different. And in principle they cannot be compared. Okay? Okay, so this is, very, this is very important because of the following. Come back to the problem of reconstructing an uh, image here. So, um, you have a surface in this four-dimensional manifold. You know that this surface must have degree 3, okay, 4 in this case, and you want to minimize the area functional. But the area functional is only defined for surfaces of degree 4. So, if you want to apply the classical methods in calculus of variations, then you have to produce variations preserving the degree. It has no sense to compare this surface, the, the A4 area of this surface, to a general surface, because the area is not defined for degree f uh, 3 surfaces. So if you want to solve here the plateau problem, and if you want to compute the minimal surfaces, what you have to do is to uh, compare your surface of degree 4 to close and, uh, surfaces also of degree 4. So you cannot make general variations. You cannot get any vector field fixing the boundary and then moving the surface. Because in general when you do this then what you are going to get are surfaces with different degree. And you don't want that. Because you want to compare this this way. You want to minimize in the class of degree 4 surfaces. Okay, so from the point of view of uh, 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 variational problems, then we are facing, even to minimize the area, to a problem with restrictions. And the restriction is to fix the degree of the sum manifold. Okay? So let me, before going to this uh, problem, which is really the, the core problem of the, of the talk, 
let me uh, mention some comments on the AD area. So A1 for degree one curves, a degree one curve is a curve containing the horizontal distribution. So the tangent vector has degree one. So this is the length of the curve. In general, this problem does not depend on the uh, Riemannian metric you are getting because uh, you are measuring the length of horizontal curves. So you only need the metric in the horizontal distribution. The first problem is a really a sub-Riemannian problem. It's not a, a general problem. This doesn't depend on the extension. You can have a, a Riemannian metric on the horizontal distribution. You can extend it to the whole manifold and then it doesn't depend on the extension. Okay, this is the classical problem of uh, geodesics in Sabrimanian geometry. Okay, and for all of you who are aware of this problem, this problem is highly non-trivial because of the existence of abnormal geodesics that these are curves that cannot be deformed by degree one curves and for many other problems. Uh, currently, we don't know even uh, the regularity of these uh, geodesics in general Carnot groups or Sabrimanian manifolds. Okay. Second, uh, when we have a 2n plus 1 dimensional contact manifold, then uh, A2n plus 1 is the, the Sarimanian area of the hypersurface. Okay. But in this way, we are um, extending the metric, the Sarimanian metric in the horizontal distribution in a canonical way by uh, assuming that the rib vector field is orthogonal to the distribution and unitary. Okay. If we do it this way, then the, the, the area does not depend on the extension, but in general it depends. And in general, uh, we have many examples where uh, the area we are defining depends on the metric we are putting. So if we start with a metric in the horizontal distribution and we extend it to the uh, whole manifold, then this is going to depend on the extension. Okay? We have examples of this. Okay, so uh, it's uh, very interesting to relate this area and uh, spherical Hausdorff measures in general. So for the whole uh, uh, D, for the homogeneous uh, dimension, this has done by Magnani and Bitoni in Carnot groups and in general for uh, uh, strictly um, Strictly regular some manifolds for uh, uh, in general Riemannian manifolds by G. An interesting remark is that uh, the uh, singular set composed of points with degree strictly smaller than the degree of the sum manifold, the D area is zero. So the size of the singular set is zero. This is very easy to compute simply by looking at this formula. Okay? So when you restrict here to the singular set, then this is zero. Okay. Okay. So uh, the problem is uh, to try to understand how minimal surfaces, how critical points of this area behave. Okay. So the first task is to compute some uh, formulas, some variational formulas. Okay. So uh, the problem is that we cannot use general vector fields to deform these surfaces. The problem is the following. Suppose you have an, this is quite classical in calculus of variation. So you have an immersion, and then uh, you say that gamma is an admissible variation if gamma t are uh, immersions. When t is equal to zero, we have the original immersion. Okay. We assume that um, the variation, the, the uh, admissible, the variation uh, gamma has compact support. This means that um, almost all points are fixed. All points outside a compact, se compact set are fixed. And then assume that the immersion has exactly the same degree of phi of m. Okay? We need this if we want to compute the first derivative of the area d functional, because otherwise we cannot measure this functional. We can only apply a d to surfaces with this degree. Okay, so uh, this is uh, an admissible variation, and of course the main problem is this one. So what happens? Uh, well, when you have a variation, then the associated variational vector field is the initial speed of the variation. Okay, so uh, there is a necessary first order condition. So suppose you have a variation, and suppose that when you move this, uh, the original immersion, you have an, another variation with the same degree of phi of m tilde. So uh, this condition has to be satisfied. This has to be zero for all 
simple vector field, fields of degree greater than m. When you move as a manifold of degree d, then you have something with a non-smaller degree. The degree can increase or can be equal, but cannot be smaller. Okay? So if you want to have exactly the same degree, then the product with simple vectors of a degree bigger, strictly bigger, than the degree of the original sum manifold has to be uh, the the scalar product has to be zero. Okay, so th this is a number of conditions, and this, this is satisfied alone for p bar bar p fixed for any t. So when you take the derivative here with respect to t, you reach this condition. This condition is a family of first order partial differential equations. Okay. So if you want to, uh, and this is an infinitesimal condition, this only depends on the initial speed of the variation. So if you want to preserve the degree, then at least at an infinitesimal level, you have to, uh, you must have this condition. This condition, this equation must be satisfied, okay? So you have as many uh, conditions as uh, vectors, independent vectors with degree bigger than m you have. Again, this is independent of the choice of the basis, as you can say. Okay, so uh, we say that uh, vector field along an immersion is uh, admissible, is satisfy this uh, condition. Okay? So the natural question is, suppose you have an immersion, Suppose you have an admissible vector field, do you have a variation so that it is the initial speed of the variation? Okay. As I mentioned before, when you consider the, the area A1 for geodesics for horizontal curves in a Sarimanian manifold, uh, there exist curves that are not uh, deformable. There are no variations of these curves. So the problem is highly non-trivial in the sense that um, we don't know. In general, we could have surfaces of degree d that can be deformed using any admissible vector fields, a vector field that could be deformed using some vector fields, or that even couldn't be deformed using any uh, variational vector field. So the problem is highly non-trivial. But of course, it's necessary to know, at least in some special cases, when an admissible vector field is integrable. Integrable in the sense that there is a variation having this vector field as an uh, initial velocity vector field. Once you know this condition, then you can apply the classical methods in the calculus of variations. You have a surface, you have your functional, you get all admissible vector fields that are integrable, and then you compute the first variation. So the condition, the Euler-Lagrange condition, is that the uh, mean curvature is orthogonal to all admissible vector fields which are integrable. Okay? Okay, so uh, we have a condition. We have a sufficient condition to ensure that any admissible vector field is integrable. Um, this sufficient condition in in the case of one-dimensional uh, some manifolds in the case of curves, is also a necessary condition. This was proven by Lucas uh, Su. Okay. Okay. So the condition is the following: we say that uh, we have an immersion of a given degree of an n-dimensional uh, manifold into a Carnot manifold, which is endowed with a Riemannian metric. So let me consider the dimension. These are the m simple m vector fields with a degree bigger than uh, d, okay, than the degree of the sum manifold. So these are l is the number of conditions, independent conditions that appear in this equation, okay. Okay. So assume that uh, we have l vector fields and l the number l is exactly equal to the number of conditions we need to ensure these equations so that for every point there exists a local adapted basis so that these equations are satisfied. If you compare these equations 
to the integrability equation, you can see that we are saying that this quantity is different from zero, that the determinant of this matrix is different from zero. Okay? So this is a regular uh, sum manifold. In general, when you consider one dimensional sum manifolds, curves in Sarimanian geometry, this regularity condition is expressed in terms of the holonomy group of, uh, of the endpoint map, map of cur for curves. Okay? This approach is equivalent to the endpoint map, but the endpoint map um, is very useful in one dimension but it's no longer useful in higher dimension, okay? So this approach is preferable in higher dimensions to the use of the endpoint map to control when a manifold is regular. Regular essentially is going to mean that every admissible variation is integrable, okay? So here we don't use uh, the criterion given by the endpoint map. We use instead this other, this different criterion, okay? So uh, our theorem is that when we have a smooth immersion of an n-dimensional manifold uh, into an equi equiregular Carnot manifold with a Riemannian metric, a regular immersion of degree d has every admissible vector field integrable. So every admissible vector field can be uh, is the initial velocity of a deformation by uh, immersions of the same degree. Okay, so. This way, one can start, one can start uh, doing the classical calculus of variations as soon as uh, one knows that uh, infinitesimal variation is going to produce a variation that allows you to compare the functionals. Okay. Okay. So the idea of the proof is simply to consider this map depending on uh, several number of parameters, and then we apply the implicit function here. Uh, yeah. Integrable means, sorry, uh, I would say that an admissible vector field is integrable, okay, if there exists uh, an, uh, a variation so that the V is the variational vector field. So we have the variational vector field. It is uh, uh, integrable, yeah, if you have an, a variation so that this is the initial velocity, okay that there is a real deformation having V as an initial velocity vector field. In general, this is not warranted as uh, the case of curves in Sarimanian manifold shows. Okay? So a criterion is needed to ensure the integrability of vector fields. This way. Okay. okay, so um, the idea of the proof is very simple. Uh, we consider a map depending on a uh, certain number of parameters so that we consider this is the Riemannian exponential map associated to the metric G and we consider this. So we want to apply the implicit function theorem and the application of the implicit function theorem is possible because of the uh, uh, regularity condition we are putting. Okay? Now we do this locally and then we make we make the use of a partition of unity or a local uniqueness of the implicit function theorem to produce uh, a, a global deformation of the of the submanifold with a fixed degree. Okay. Okay, so uh, consequences. Uh, well, first, uh, comments. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, followed this approach. This approach is based on the Griffiths uh, formalism in calculus of variations. Okay? For curves, this approach is equivalent to the, to the use of the uh, endpoint map in, uh, in Sabrimanian geometry. But in general, this approach is uh, more fruitful if you go to higher dimensions. Okay? Because the endpoint map uh, cannot be defined in higher dimensions. Okay? So in dimension one, this uh, sufficient condition is also ne necessary. So, I mean, you can, uh, you know exactly which vector fields are uh, uh, integrable or not. Admissible vector fields are integrable. Okay, so um, any hypersurface in a contact manifold is al always deformable. This uh, property mm, is uh, absolutely trivial because it's the degree is maximum, so the condition is void, so you don't have to see. So in, for people who work on uh, hypersurfaces or maybe uh, three-dimensional uh, pseudo-media manifolds, the integrability condition has no sense because the integrability 
the uh, theorem is void. The, this condition, this condition is void. I mean, there are no vector fields with degree bigger than two n plus two. Yeah, that's sure. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Integrable means that uh, you have a deformation of the degree d original sub manifolds by degree d sub manifolds. The problem is to produce a deformation so, so that the AD area is well defined. And you can only do this when you deform your degree d surface sub manifold by degree d sub manifolds. Yeah, the assumption is that the. What are the assumptions that they show that this is integrable? Regular. That means. This condition. The existence of some of, of, a, of a family, of an independent family of vector fields, uh, V1, VL, so that this determinant is different from zero. So you have, you have a maximal family and enough large number of deformations so that the degree is not preserved in some sense. So you can use these uh, vector fields to produce a variation starting from an initial velocity with, uh, and the idea of the proof is simply to consider this deformation. This is the admissible vector field, okay? So you have a parameter, parameter t and you have these parameters uh, depending on the vector fields uh, obtained from the regularity condition. So you want to uh, express uh, P and T, sorry, uh, all these quantities in terms of T and P tilde. And you use the implicit function theorem simply by using the, this condition. Okay, okay so uh, in contact manifolds, the problem is trivial for hypersurfaces. Uh, every deformation is, every admissible vector field is integrable, so you don't have to, to take care of this, uh, this problem. Uh, if you take this function, this is the, the one we consider, and indeed this was the original, the original uh, surface we, uh, that we studied in the angle manifold, then uh, this is also deformable because you can find two uh, independent vector fields so that uh, the condition is satisfied. So in principle, w for this surface, we can uh, have this property. So uh, whenever we have a regular immersion, then we can compute the first variation formula. Simply, we take the first derivative of the degree d area, uh, we compute the derivative, and then we apply the first uh, uh, kind of divergence theorem, and then we have an orthogonality condition for uh, admissible vector fields. I haven't written up this formula yet because the expression is not usable yet. Okay. In particular cases, you can write down this uh, this formula. For instance, in this case and some other explicit cases. But in general, the the this is still work in progress, and the formula is still not uh, I mean not very nice to see in a, in a blackboard. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Manuel. Um, some question? So, in a non-regular case, do we also have higher order obstructions? So second order, third order obstructions? Mm. In a non-regular case, you could have some admissible vector fields which are integrable and some others which, which are not. Probably that, that depends on the rank of, uh, of the matrix. I mean, in general, there, there are no, you don't know what happens in the non regular case. Well, oh. For example, if you look at Einstein deformations, mm -hmm. they also have such first order obstructions, but if they vanish, then you have higher order obstructions. I don't know. Also, such a hierarchy? I don't know. In general, I think that uh, depending, you can replace the, this condition of the determinant to be different from zero by a rank. Condition. This way, probably you can deform in some cases and not in some other cases. But I don't know what happens in this case. Mm -hmm. Other comments?
okay. <laughs> um, if you wish to consider like a plateau problem, yeah. um, can you show that uh, maybe under generic conditions, the infimum of these areas yeah, is actually positive? That infimum of the areas, uh, yeah. For instance, in in the in this case, in the case we are considering, the area is if you can uh, you have the curve and you can project to the retinal plane, the area is always bigger than the Euclidean area. Okay. The projection. So in this case, for instance, you can do it. In general cases, probably you have to make some other comparison. But uh, at least for this kind of surfaces, you can ensure that you get uh, something positive, some positive area. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. What's that question? Uh, in the case, a very initial example, so codimension one, graphical case, mm -hmm. you expect that on a small convex board the plot problem could be always solvable? You mean in the three dimensional right. contact case? Uh, yeah, even in the, the initial example, it's yeah, y theta. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Pro probably, uh, I can imagine that you, if you put some geometric conditions on the initial curve, then uh, you have solutions for the plateau problem. But for a small, for curves in a small balls, <coughs> I'm not so sure. Yeah. Uh, under complexity assumptions, I'm sure, and, but even in larger balls. But, uh, yeah, but uh, you have to put an, uh, I think you have to put an additional geometric condition on the curve. And yeah. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you know in the Heisenberg, if you know that the curve projects to the plane, in a, um, is C to alpha probably, then you know that, that there is assistance. And that's it, that the assistance is a Lipschitz uh, minimal surface. Yeah. You simply take uh, the, the family of approximating the many metrics, you solve the plateau problem for these metrics, and then you pass to the limit. So there is a uniform bound on the gradient, and then you have a Lipschitz uh, limit. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I, I can use it. So <laughs> uh, no, my question was uh, uh, more related to the dependence uh, yeah. so, um, of the, the surface area from the Riemannian metric. So yeah. at which extent uh, you make uh, so hope uh, or guess that there is any way yeah. to get a surface measure that in some sense only depend on the sub Riemannian metric that would be in some sense uh, the we dream yeah, or yeah, not. Sure. We have examples where the uh, degree D area depends, does depend on the Riemannian metric. We have two different Riemannian metrics coinciding in the horizontal distribution so that the, the degree D area is, is different. If you don't put additional conditions on the extension, then for sure you are going to have different uh, area measures. In special cases, uh, if you extend appropriately the Riemannian metric, or if you have some kind of in global invariance, like in Carnot groups or mm -hmm. so, you may have a kind of uh, uniqueness in some sense. I mean, up to a constant, up to... For instance, if you have, a, if your surface uh, has let's say degree three, four, and you know that the one vector is in the tangent distribution and the other in a one-dimensional distribution, if you change the Riemannian metric in the last distribution, then, I mean, uh, for sure the, 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 the area is going to, to be uh, replaced by a constant times the original area. Mm -hmm. So in principle you would have the same minimal surfaces because the, the, the area functionals are equivalent in some sense. But in general, I don't expect the, this the degree D the area to be a sub Riemannian invariant. This is the reason why in all theorems we are talking about uh, Carnot manifolds endowed with a Riemannian metric. Because yes, uh, yes. everything depends on the Riemannian metric. It's not, it's not really a sub Riemannian problem in general. Mm -hmm. In some particular cases it is, but not in general. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I propose to follow the discussion around the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we back in the, at uh, 20. Okay, for the next talk. Thanks, Manuel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay, so, <laughs> so I was your question. Okay, oh, yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah. So what kind of methods do you have to find minimizers? It's can you I'm not a specialist in those things, but can you use German methods to and such things? Do you have to severely ad adapt it? Thanks, and that was yeah. very nice. Um, do you mean if the... Uh, you, 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 I'm not at all a specialist in German method theory. But I know, know from talks that usually yeah. if you write, write minimal services or yeah, yeah, yeah. hyper-services you use often German the, method uh, theory, then you have to regularity theory. At the beginning, at yeah. the beginning I said that uh, I was not going to talk about regularity. Yeah. I mean, because uh, once you have the functional, yeah. then of course you can extend it, you can... Um, the, the, the functional yeah. can be defined even yeah. for leaps, it's uh, uh, yeah. some manifolds. Uh, and now you have also, of course, the regularity problem for minimal the variational problem. Does it all make sense in a even current in the, sense? And even in the Heisenberg group, it's not known the, what, what's the, the, the optimal regularity. Yeah. For instance, in, in H1, yeah. there are... Uh, H1 is a three-dimensional one. It's a three-dimensional yeah. one, and um, the area is quite classical. The area is very easy to understand in the Heisenberg, because you, you have... A, you have a three-dimensional manifold, you have a planar distribution, uh, you have a metric in this planar distribution, and you have... So, uh, really, the, the area is simply the horizontal projection. Well, this is the Riemannian metric, and this is the horizontal projection of the, of the unit normal with respect to the left invariant Riemannian metric. Okay, so this way you have a, a well-behaved functional, and this can be applied to Lipschitz, even Lipschitz, Euclidean and Lipschitz functions, okay? And uh, what, what's the regularity you expect? Mm -hmm. You have plenty of solutions of the Bernstein problem that are entire graphs over the x y plane. Bernstein problems are minimal surfaces on the graph. Yeah, exactly. So you have uh, you have three coordinates x, y, and t. So you have solutions of the minimal surface equation uh, that are only Euclidean Lipschitz. And they are very, very nice to see, which are these surfaces. Pick a horizontal line, pick a, pick a line in a plane, and then fix an angle function. So that, uh, let's say that the angle is uh, decreasing so that, that there are no intersections of different half lines, okay? So this is a planar configuration. Now, lift this curve to the Heisenberg as a horizontal curve, and lift these curves as horizontal curves. Then you have a surface in the Heisenberg group. What a, a surface yeah, in yeah, the Heisenberg yeah. group. So this is a global minimal surface and it's also area minimizing. It's a solution of the bursting problem. For any angle function, monotone angle function you set, mm -hmm. and around this line is only Euclidean ellipses. Yeah. Depends on the on the regularity of the function alpha. One other thing, with such techniques can you also formulate as problems in Heisenberg groups and things like this? There are essentially the main problem is the problem of regularity of minimizers of the Sarimanian area. Yeah. Nothing is and known. And somehow, if you look at the classical Heisenberg manifold with the Riemannian metric, yeah. and if you look at the limit of large force, then do they yeah. converge in some sense? Yeah, uh, such yeah. indeed, for instance, if you, if you have a. Um, in the Heisenberg, if you have a. Mm -hmm. a for, uh, let's say a convex curve and uh, any graph over this convex curve. Then, for the Riemannian metric, you can solve this plateau problem. Yeah. Okay? And um, planes in the Heisenberg yeah. for any Riemannian metric are minimal surfaces. Are, it's simply yeah, a computation. Yeah. So, if you have a solution of the plateau problem here, at any point in this curve, which is mm -hmm. convex and C to alpha, then you can put a supporting uh, plane, mm -hmm. which is a minimal surface. So, it's a barrier. So it's, what? it's a barrier. Yeah. It's, so you have uniform gradient uh, bounds mm -hmm. for solutions of the minimal surface equation for any Riemannian metric, uniform in R, in the parameter of the Riemannian metric. So you can pass to the limit because you have a uniform, uh, a sequence of uniform Lipschitz functions. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you pass to the limit, you have a minimal surface in the sub Riemannian Heisenberg group. Oh, yeah. And the limit is Lipschitz. Oh, yeah. 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 But Mm, in general, what is known is that when you have some limits, the limits satisfy some good regularity. You may ask uh, Giovanna Chitti. Giovanna Chitti knows a lot about uh, these uh, problems because she has been studying uh, viscosity solutions yeah. of uh, minimal surface equations. Viscosity means that there are limits of Riemannian minimal surfaces. Yeah. And uh, the problem is that when you do this process, you get a lot of regularity, more than expected.
Oh, yeah. So either not all minimal surfaces in the Heisenberg are limits of Riemannian minimal surfaces, or we don't know how how to face the problem of regularity. Oh, yeah. But it's an open problem. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Ah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's good. So, one material. One material. Okay, so I'm going to out. Yeah, yeah, now it has been. Um, well, about four years. Is that right? Maybe, maybe it's because my last thing went for Granada or... Uh, could be, yeah, yeah. I think I came in maybe 2015. Okay, so... Uh, or probably I just moved. Yeah, we're in the middle. So it's a little bit chaotic because we... So uh, we had all our things in the UK. And then we spent one year in Trieste after coming back to Italy. But we decided to have the things uh, shipped and once we would find an apartment. But in the meanwhile, the moving company sort of went broke. <laughs> so it was really complicated to have uh, our things back. And so we even didn't know whether they were still there. Eventually, yes, but it was really painful. So I think we were probably in the middle of, uh, of that. So eventually they, they came, um, like the last week of July, and uh, David Lewis was given, uh, so because we could not arrange uh, for a date, so uh, the Lewis was given to the event, and also his visit was kind of uh, screwed up because of the day. So. <laughs> but apart from that, you know, everything uh, is fine. Yeah. So my daughter is now just uh, one. Just one, yeah. So it's a foreign castle. It's actually a nice place for to grow. So it's a small town, you can grow by bike. So they have some green areas, also the beach is close. So. Yes.
Um, so if you are a speaker and if you agree uh, of um, being, uh, I mean, that your <coughs> recording uh, is published on the web, please uh, fill uh, this uh, form, okay? Uh, and the forms are uh, here. It's just one signature, baby. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's very, very quick to, to fill. Okay. Okay, so the next talk to this morning is uh, Carlo Montegazza, Revolution by Curvature of Network in the Plane. Thanks. <coughs> uh, thanks to Andrea and Luciano for the kind invitation. It's always a kind of coming back home when I speak in Pisa. And uh, as, I, as my title says, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, a long-term project that is going on for several years now. We started with Matteo Novaga and Vincenzo Tortorelli in 2003, then uh, with my ex-PhD student Annibal Magni. Started, we, well, we had a period that we didn't had any kind of uh, improvement. Then we restarted the, in, with the thesis of Annibale. Then, um, well, Alessandra Pluda is uh, an ex-PhD student of Matteo, and uh, also in his PhD thesis we won, and we started collaborating with Felix Schulze about that, uh, which is uh, one of the competitor group, competitor group uh, which is uh, composed by Felix Schulze, Andre Neves, and Tom Ilmanen. And very recently, a couple of guys, my colleagues in Naples, Pietro Baldi and Emanuel House, started uh, to got interested in some, uh, well, spin-off of this project. It's a classification of uh, self-similar solution to the network flow. So what I'm interested, then I get back to this for a while, I'm interested in moving by, let evolving by curvature, a network of curves like this which is more or less a graph in the plane. And uh, why moving by curvature? Well, uh, there's several reasons. One, uh, the easiest one is that if you imagine that, well, you can think of an elastic network curves, so that it's under tension, that you let it evolve, and uh, the energy around is only the total length of the network, the sum of the length of all the curves of the network. And so, like for an hypersurface, which is a smooth object, the, the gradient flow associated to the, total, to the length uh, is simply the motion by mean, the mean curvature. In this case, it's the motion by curvature. There's only one curvature in, for curves, uh, which means that at every point, this curve must move in normal direction with a velocity which is equal to the curvature of the curve passing by there. Moreover, if you think of this, uh, curves, uh, well, the, on, of these regions inside the curves, like uh, some kind of uh, liquid materials, for instance. Suppose that this represents immiscible liquid uh, stuff in the planar domain, so oil, fuel, or water. And uh, the curves are simply the interfaces between the phases of this uh, two-dimensional system, uh, this uh, planar system. And uh, suppose in the easiest situation that your, the energy of your system is only given by the total length of the, of the interfaces, then you can also think of something more complicated, some in distributed energies inside the regions, or constraint, or more complicated energies like elastic energy, like one plus uh, the curvature square on the interfaces. So you have your functional on this situation. You want to study dynamics. Uh, you do gradient flow of the system. and. Uh, you arrive at studying, in the easiest case, the, mean cu the curvature flow of this, uh, this guy. This is actually, was actually done with simulation and even actual experiments. And uh, even if this is so simple, this model is quite good, uh, quite in accord with experiments. Uh, for, for instance, for in several uh, real situations, like evolution of grind boundaries in polycrystalline materials. Uh, and I'm not an expert in the uh, physics or engineering about behind that, not even in the numerics. Uh, we got the problem and tried to study it from a... I don't want to cheat. I really <laughs> take mathematics and uh, we did mathematics forgetting about actually all the application, but there are 
several people interested in the application. There is a large group uh, of uh, kinderlehrer in the uh, US that they do all the stuff, mathematics, uh, simulation and experiments in order to, to study these objects. Actually, we were also interested because this guy is in a sense well, a singular object. It's not an hypersurface, not a curve. It's something which, uh, from a geometric point of view, it's really singular because it has this multiple junction here. In this case, you see triple junction between the curves. And uh, in a way, because of the one-dimensional uh, setting and the one-co-dimensional setting, you can also study these guys in R3, for instance, but we, we assume it to be in the plane. In a way, it's the simplest uh, motion by curvature of an object, which is in a way the simplest, uh, sing essentially singular, but uh, singular object. So the easiest case is when you move out from the smooth curves, in a way. In, in, in fact, uh, after the classical, by now classical, works of Wisken and Hamilton also, about mean curvature flow of curves and hypersurfaces, smooth curves and hypersurfaces, compact usually, in co-dimension one, so in, uh, in the Euclidean space, uh, well, uh, they got a lot of results, geometric results, analytical results, and uh, at some point, uh, people, in particular, more from analysis, they wanted, since the mean curvature flow was uh, so useful in several situations, it appears in several situations, in particular in the application, and uh, I remember at some point, we can say, saying at some conference, saying actually, this period of mean curvature is sexy because was <laughs> mean curvature flow is sexy because uh, there was a lot of new definition of uh, evolution for mean curvature for, for more or less everything. There are definitions, for instance, the level sets uh, that you have a, a definition of motion by mean curvature even of simple closed set in the Euclidean space. But as you can imagine, the more you enlarge your definition, the more enlarged the class of objects you want to let evolve, the less you get uh, detail, regularity, or regularity results, or uh, theorems describing what's really happened during your flow. So in a way, we wanted to still use the techniques to the machinery of differential geometry first and PDEs that uh, Whisk and Hamilton first use it to understand the smooth situation in exactly the, uh, to try to see how much you can push all these techniques uh, if you don't want to enlarge too much the class of, uh, of the object you want to let evolve. So, uh, so we, we think that the easiest case was like this. So and try to see if in this case of networks you can use more or less all the techniques that uh, come from the smooth case, from the particular from the differential geometry and uh, and PD in particular. Well, uh, also this is clearly a toy model. We want well, the the big uh, the big goal would be to do the same in uh, any dimension and co-dimension. In particular, in particular for application, here as I, I said, two-dimensional system. But it would be super interesting if you can do the same for three-dimensional system. So real object, three-dimensional object where you have interfaces around. Think, for instance, the the, the, the leading problem would be understanding the dynamics of a cluster of bubbles, for instance, which is the two-dimensional analog of this problem. I'm going to, to speak about that at the end. Very few. Um, okay, we try to, to well, we simply started with the, what Hamilton and Whisker did. We started to extending results to the situation. And at some point we found uh, the <coughs> difficulties. Difficulties related, as you can imagine, to the triple junction, triple, multiple junction in your network. The point is that uh, Actually, the main tool in, under, in the analyzing uh, the, the smooth case, in particular to get out uh, estimates, it's maximum principle. In geometric flows, like for the Ricci flow, mean for Ricci flow, maximum principle is uh, the, the main tool that you use to get out estimate. In this case, you know, maximum principle, <coughs> as you all know, can be used if your maximum is at the interior of your set. 
if you have a smooth curve without boundary, there is no boundary. There is no boundary. Every point is an interior. If the curve is compact, every function has a maximum at an interior point. In this case, it can happen sometimes that the quantities you want to estimate by means of maximum principle, their maximum turns out to, well, at least you cannot exclude a priori that your maximum falls down exactly in the triple, in the multiple junction. So, in a way, in a boundary, in the boundary of your curve. In that situation, you cannot use maximum principle. In fact, in some cases we were able to, to do some kind of uh, a priori conclusion that the maximum cannot fall down in the boundary, so you can use the same. And in that case, we could use the same arguments that we're using in the smooth case. In other cases, we could not generalize that, and we, sometimes we turn out we need to introduce uh, some extra variational techniques, uh, in particular esti some estimates became integral estimates, not uh, pointwise estimates, like when you use maximum principle. This is because in uh, several situations, that I'm going to discuss in a while, this junction, for instance, are triple junction, and the free curves have intersection at 120 degrees, which means that the free tangent vector to the free curves add to zero. If you have 123 equal angles or 120 degrees, the sum of the tangents is zero. And in a way, this, uh, if your quantity is good, that uh, the contribution after integration by parts and manipulation of your integral, when you do when you, the, the boundary contribution, in a way, add to zero. So from a distributional point of view, in several situations, several interesting quantities, these points are not boundary points. Because, I uh, say inner point, because you have cancellation due to, the, due to the fact if the free angles are the same. So that's, uh, in a way, the key in order that the several estimates becomes, uh, they cannot be done point-wise because of this uh, lack of maximum principle, but can be done integral by means of integral estimate because you have cancellation at these distributionally non-boundary points, more or less. This is uh, the main difference between the two lines, uh, the classic and uh, what we had to develop in order to deal with this problem. Okay, so as I said, let's skip the application, let's uh, see the math. This is uh, the formalization of what I'm discussing. So we have, uh, what this network is uh, described by a family of curves, gamma i. And uh, well, you have to put in your system uh, all this, in a way you have to write down a system that describes the structure of the network. You have to say that the free curves coming here has this uh, end point in common, that uh, and describe in, in the structure of your equation the, the structure of a nature. But then, if one, when you want to do evolution, the, the, the equation leading to the evolution is simply this, which is the motion by mean curvature, in this case, motion by curvature, simply, that uh, if you take the time derivative of your, well, you have this curve parameterized by a time uh, parameter here, uh, described on a map from 0, 1 to R2 and the time parameter, the time derivative of your curve in normal direction, which means this is the velocity of motion of your curve, you take the normal component, you want to be equal to the curvature. And the elementary differential geometry tells us that uh, the curvature of a curve is given by a second derivative. This curve are not in arc length, and in any parametrization. It's not useful to keep the arc length fixed, the parametrization in proportion to arc length. So it's a second derivative divided the square of the first derivative, and uh, this is simply the projection on the normal component. Nu here is the normal to your, to your curve, which is exactly this guy here. So you ask that the normal component of the velocity at every point, up to the boundary points, you see here, till the boundary of the interval, is given by the curvature, till the end points. What this means is that you have a freedom. Well, now you look for a solution of this, in at least to start your flow. 
This means that uh, you, have, no, you don't ask any control on the tangential part of the velocity because it doesn't appear here. Which means that if I found I, th there could be several evolution with different tangential components that solve this one. So a good uh, idea, see, if you see at this problem, and uh, you go and write down, you linearize, uh, write down the symbol, because of the fact that you, pro you are projecting on the normal component, you write down the symbol, this is a parabolic system, which can be degenerate because of this projection. So there is no an easy, ready to be used result in order to have a solution for small time, actually. But actually, since you can choose the component, the tangential component, what you can do here is that actually in uh, doing this, taking this part here, gamma xx uh, divided by the square of gamma x, and projection on, projection on the normal, it's exactly throwing away the tangential component of this guy here. So if I solve the problem, forget the projection here and the projection here. If I solve the problem gamma t equals to all this without the projection, I'm solving an equation which differs by this one only for a tangential part. And uh, as you can imagine, if I throw away this and you start with a set of regular curves, which means that this guy here is always one. Uh, you can start parameterizing whatever you want, your initial network. Well, this is a quasi-linear, now no more degenerate, parabolic system, actually, that, uh, under some hypothesis on the structure of your network that I'm going to say, tell you in a while, it enters in the scheme uh, developed by Solonikov of uh, uh, existence for a small time. So this is a, a trick that actually uh, I don't think we did invent it because actually I'm going to, to tell you in a while we were lucky there was already a small time existence result for a very particular situation by Leah Bronson and Fernando Reitish that was our starting point in order to have a generalized small time existence result. Okay, but before Okay, as I said, this I already said that uh, also from a mathematical point of view can be seen as geometric gradient flow by the length, by the total length of the of the network. Okay, before going on, I wanted to show you a simulation which was realized by Ken Brake of a more complicated situation. Here it's, you have to think it's uh, periodical. It's like you are on a torus. So this guy here, it's, it's in it. and uh, apparently, what uh, as I told you, I'm not checking. I'm not. I don't know the physics, engineering, and numerics. But they told me that uh, it's very in accord with the experiments. Actually, even if it is um, apparently very easy. Now, when they get a little bit larger, you can start seeing something. So, a very first observation is that uh, larger regions, or actually more precisely, regions with more than six edges, increase, increase their area. Instead, regions with less than six edges, they decrease and eventually disappear. Now, the larger regions are winning and uh, second observation is that okay this um, that uh, there are it happens that there are at almost every time time where there is not a collapse over region or of a single curve like I'm trying to guess could happen here so there are, you see there are two changes of the structure of your network the first the easiest one is then when a region collapses and vanish. The second one is only when your region loses one of its edges. For instance, these edges here, before this or this region is collapsing, is going away. It shrinks down to a point, forming for one time a four point here. Instead, 
For instance, if uh, this region collapses at some point, you will have a one, two, three, four, five, six point there. Actually, this region cannot collapse since six is a cutting number. Regions with six edges maintains their area. So before collapsing, it must happen that one of these edges must vanish. Okay, let's see what happens. And and actually, another another observation. These uh, strange strange moments, strange times, when uh, uh, when there is a change, are isolated. And in all the other times, we only see triple junction. With the exception of this great set of times, you only see triple junction around, and uh, all the triple junction have the same 120 degrees. Now let's see if this is going to disappear as I... Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, here there is a small... Uh, <laughs> I was unlucky. Okay. Now it's better. Only triple junction around. Okay, let's see if uh, it goes like a bet. Yeah. And the second observation is that uh, when you have this collapse of a curve, then you have uh, two pairs of two curves getting together. Uh, you just see. So you have this collapse this curve collapse like it just happened over there and if you get something like this with 100, 20, 60, 60 and then immediately after there is an opening in the other direction Which is exactly what just happened here. Now let's see the, the end that possibly this phenomenon is going to happen again. But just here is, this is a collapse and immediately an opening like that in the other direction. Okay, these are only simulation. You, con you look at uh, 1,000 of this simulation and you start doing conjecture that all these things that I told you, it's always like that. You are always see. Well, this fact that, the, um, that you have only triple junction and angles between the free curve and 120 degrees shouldn't be so surprising. We study minimal surfaces or anyway variational uh, problems on, co on uh, stuff like this because uh, triple junction with 120 degrees are critical points, stable critical points for the length. If you have a, a four junction is not stable from the length. If you have this and you immediately if you open a little bit this guy has suppose a fixed end points. Uh, this guy has less length even if you open a very small amount in this direction. Moreover, there is also, since I, I draw this, uh, you, can also, uh, you can also guess that the uniqueness is a problem in all this stuff. Because uh, when I do this uh, argument of opening in this way, well, I because of symmetry, I can also do the same in the other direction. So there is a structural problem with uniqueness in the wall, uh, in the wall problem. Okay, so yeah, I collect uh, the observation that I said before. So this is the easiest. It's only a computation that the area behaves like I said, and. Um, this is what I said, that there is an ex the exception of a set of times where there is some change of your structure, only triple junction around, only with all, all of them angles of 120 degrees. And uh, s we call this network regular because, uh, well, it's the basic object, actually, we, we, that we hope. It's 
the basic object you see in your, in your evolution. And uh, if there is no region collapsing, so only a single curve is collapsing, a single edge of a region, but without the whole region collapsing, you always see this collapsing four points with these uh, angles, with these precise angles, not four points, whatever, exactly this kind of four points, 120, 120, 60, 60. And uh, reopening in the other direction with the, the creation of other two triple junctions. Okay, and now a confession. Up to now, we are not able to prove anything, fully prove anything of all this, actually. Only the first. The first is a simple computation, one-line computation. And, uh, well, uh, showing that actually this observation and, uh, are true uh, was the main goal that we tried to, to address. And actually realized that, uh, well, apparently it's simple statement, simple problem curves at the end, but uh, apparently you need a lot of uh, technology that I'm going to, to mention from analysis on one side and from uh, geometry on the other side. The main technology is blow up analysis, actually, which uh, at the end uh, um, where enters uh, a lot analysis in order for the procedure and geometry for the understanding of what you find out after blowing up your, your flow. Okay, so we started in 2003 with the easiest situation. The easiest situation, because we, did, we weren't able to do anything, so we started. <laughs> the situation, situation that we consider a convex guy, convex domain, a sim the simplest network, free curves connecting initially at 120 degrees at the triple junction. In a way, it's, if you think of uh, this guy, it's uh, like you restrict yourself to look at what happens around one single triple junction. It's a kind of local analysis, hoping that your local analysis can be extended to the world network. And we realize you cannot do it so easily. So, this is a regular, regular means like before that you have 120 degrees here, actually. So fortunately, as I said, there was around uh, previous, uh, already something in 1992 by Leah Bronson and Fernando Reitich that they uh, worked out a small time existence result solving that equation of uh, motion by curve that I wrote you before for this guy here with some additional geometric assumption, kind of uh, being uh, uh, graph partially a graph over some, uh, these, these two curves be a graph over some uh, line, actually. But uh, morally, we simply extend the theorem to the general situation, but morally all the, all the techniques was already present in uh, the paper by Bronson Reitich, using, as I said, Solonikov theory. Actually, not getting into the details, but uh, you have uh, more or less, you have to ask not only 180 degrees, but also that the sum of the free curvature at the triple junction is zero. If you ask that, uh, then you fit perfectly in Solonikov theory. This uh, sum of the free curvature is zero. It's what uh, is called complementary condition in Solonikov theory. And uh, Solonikov theory produces a small time existence result for this situation. Then uh, you can uh, have a small time existence result without this condition the sum of free curves by approximation, by C2 approximation. Well, uh, not by, by C1 approximation. And uh, what you can see that the evolving flow, the evolving network, the evolving triad in this case, stays regular. Regular means that you still have 120, deg still have 120 degrees condition satisfied, which is called herring condition. Herring was, uh, well, the problem actually started by metallurgists that they observe this kind of behavior, studying the, um, the formation of ground boundaries in, uh, in metals, actually. And uh, actually I think the, the first guy that uh, stated the problem was uh, called Mullins in the end of 60, and also this guy Herring that observed that at the triple junction you always have 120 degrees uh, between the three interfaces, was also another 
um, people from applied mathematics. Okay, there is uh, immediately a problem with uniqueness. The natural uh, space where you look for uniqueness is the two spaces, one in, uh, in time, actually. You only have unique, we actually, by the, this Thessalonic of theory, you only have uniqueness if you work in C2 plus 2 alpha, C in, in space, C1 plus a parabolic spaces, C1 plus alpha in time. But if you try to look uniqueness in, the natural, in this natural class, like of curves or upper surfaces, compact upper surfaces or compact curves in the plane, and you do usually by means maximum principle, here you cannot use integral arguments. You have to use maximum principle, and maximum principle has problems, like I said before, because you cannot use it because you have endpoints. From a point-wise point of view, you have endpoints. And so uniqueness, even in this simpler case, it's still an open problem. It's, we actually hope at the end that for the generic initial data, well, in this case, we hope to prove uniqueness, but for the general network, and we hope for generic initial data, you are, will be able to have uniqueness. But this problem, uh, no one is able at the moment to say anything, even in this super simple case. Second uh, problem is that, OK, we start. Always thinking to this simple, simple situation. We start, we have a flow, so the, all the flow goes on for all time. And uh, as you can expect, uh, it will converge to the minimal connection, the Steiner connection between the three points on the boundary that we keep fixed, actually. Or something happens, a singularity, like that happens, always happens in geometric flows. Uh, what, what kind of uh, curvature you prescribe as the, the vertice? Here? No, no prescription. Let it talk. Let it talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Also, the vertex must move in normal direction equal to the curvature of the curves arriving for the all three curves. There is one and exactly one direction that satisfies that. So, sorry? Oh, some of the, the scalar of the curvature, the real the numbers, not the vectors. Is zero. You take a vector, the curvature vector. No, sorry. Well, no, the sum of the three scalar curvature, not the vector, not the sum of the vector, sum of the numbers. Okay, yes, yes. That must be zero. Yes, maybe it's the same because if you take the sum. No, no, it's not the same. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, that, that must be zero. That's a yes. complementary condition. In, if you want to put all this in the Solonic of theory, Com complementary condition or order two. Yes, my question was just taking the sum instead of other four. In the sum yeah. So you have a singularity. You want to. You ask yourself uh, why a singularity happens, and uh, and uh, what we were able to show independently with this uh, uh, with the other group of uh, the Mann and Evan Schulze and uh, with Arnibal Emani, Emi and Matteo is that uh, till there is no collapse of the curves so till the free curves they don't go to zero in length uh, you have full regularity so the only catastrophe is that uh, one curve goes to zero which means that your triple junction went uh, to one of the boundary points in a way your triode is trying to get out in, in minimizing its length, it's trying to get out of your domain. And you can imagine that, uh, since as I said, that uh, if uh, your flow goes on for all time, you expect uh, that it's going to converge to a minimal connection between the three points. But uh, sometimes the minimal connection is not a triad. If you have take a triangle with this here larger than 120, the minimal connection between the three vertices is simply these two. The Steiner point, the point where you have a minimal connection between the three, three corners of a triangle, 
is interior only exists only if the known of the three angles of the, your triangle is larger than 120. Otherwise, the minimal connection is given by these two. So in a way, if you start with something like this, it's pushing to become like this and possibly to get out. If you move and you put your network start here, actually this is going to be something like this, possibly. So it's trying to get out. So it happens that one curve can go to zero, actually, if you have free sense in this situation. So if it doesn't, doesn't happen, well, your flow is smooth for every time, uh, and asymptotically you get the Steiner configuration connecting the free endpoints. Okay, in a way it can be seen as a local regularity result for the flow of a regular general network like this, for instance, because you are in a way restricting around one triple junction and you expect that also now, if you don't have a collapse of a curve or of a region, if a region collapses, a curve collapses, obviously. So if you have no collapse of the curve, you have the same result. You hope that without collapsing over the curve, everything is smooth like before, if you start with a regular initial network. Unfortunately, and, and actually, you know, regularity is a local matter, usually. So we have regularity result, and so why you cannot use it to describe the same, to get a, this regularity, general regularity result? Well, what we didn't, we didn't realize that in proving this, for this guy, we use a kind of geometric quantity around, a kind of uh, isoperimetric style quantity around that we needed in the proof at some point that uh, it's uh, always larger than zero, larger than some constant, it's not going to zero. Kind, well actually, it's a mixing between uh, isoperimetric and embeddedness quantity. We don't want in a way that uh, curves get too close to each other. They cannot get to touch, but not even that. We don't want that we not get close enough because uh, all the analysis here and also in the original situation is based on blow-up techniques. So you pose, you have a singularity, you do a rescaling, uh, try to find out what you get at the end of the rescaling and actually it turns out that you find out a self-similar solution actually self-shrinking network moving by curvature. And you don't want these guys, like in several other occasions when you use blow up technique for minimal surfaces or flows, you don't want that your limit has multiplicity larger than one. Because lar mul larger multiplicity, a line with multiplicity two can hide a lot of things. It's not, can be two lines going to be together, but also two half lines with double that at the end you don't see. So if you really want to get a uh, regularity results in all this situation, it's usually very important, exclude that what you see in the limit after your blow up as multiplicity one. And also here, in order to exclude that, well, this is our try to exclude that when you do all this uh, procedure, you don't get mul higher multiplicity guys is to be sure that curves cannot get too close. So if they cannot get too close, or cannot get too close fast enough, in the limit you cannot get higher multiplicity guys. And uh, in order to exclude that, we introduce, uh, inspired by the work of Whisk and Hamilton, a kind of isoperimetric embeddedness quantity that in this case, and actually <laughs> quite funny, in the case that you only have one or two triple junction around, so <laughs> quite uh, limited uh, families of networks, this quantity is bounded, is monotone, so bounded away from zero during the flow, but if you have at least three triple junction around, you, st you are not able to prove monotonicity, so bounding this quantity positively from below, and we cannot exclude, I will tell you in a while, we cannot exclude the possibility that doing blow up you get higher multiplicity limits. And this is the main problem in extending the previous regularity result to, the gener to a general network with more than two triple junctions. With two we are able to do it, more than two 
it's uh, at the moment it's an open problem. So what happens at the singularity? What is this uh, more precise in this uh, this uh, kind of analysis? What happens at singularity? Well, like in uh, well, this is the, the extension of the well. Also, well, sorry, I should have said before the small time exists result instead it's straightforward. It's only a matter of higher complication, but the same theorem can be extended to several, to a more complicated network. So this network starts, stays smooth, 120 degrees, the condition is satisfied, and for a while the, you, you have your flow. Then a singularity happens, and what happens in singularity, like several occasions of this flow, at the singularity at least one of the two conditions must uh, be verified, so the curvature could be abounded, goes to plus infinity, or in this situation, differently by curves and upper surfaces, there is a next another condition is that uh, it can happen that the length of some curve goes to zero. So we have a structural change. And uh, the theorem before on the triad that I'm saying we wanted to generalize to the general network says that actually this always must be true. Then you can separate cases. In if uh, one length is going to zero and the curvature is bounded, and one length is going to zero and the curvature is unbounded. But uh, this absolutely must happen. So this is a theorem, so one of the two must happen, and <coughs> what we are missing with this uh, argument of multiplicity, multiplicity, is that actually this is necessary. This always happens. There is always some structural change at a singularity. And this is more or less what I said, that there is no a direct connection because uh, in uh, blow-up analysis, uh, you want to exclude the higher multiplicity guys. Actually, you know you get shrinkers and you want uh, genuine shrinkers, not hiding other things inside that. Actually, you only will need that you cannot get a double line to be more, even more technical. If you are able to exclude it after a blow up, you don't get a double line, well, from that you can deduce you don't get anything with agar multiplicity. And uh, this program works. So unfortunately, at the moment, we are not able to prove that. You know, blow up, you, pay, you take your evolving flow, you rescale it parabolically, you enlarge in order that the curvature of the rescaled flows is bounded, so you have enough compactness to pass the limit, and you get a limit flow, which is still a curvature flow of networks, by means of whisk and monotonicity formula, which also works in this case. You can conclude this as a shrinker. Then, next step is to classify the shrinker, and uh, you also know, want to know that uh, they have multiplicity of one. So you, at the end, if this conjecture is true, that is um, our main open problem at the moment, you'll get after blow up a shrinker, multiplicity one network, and you want to classify them. And classification can be done in some situation. It's, not, it's difficult in general, but it's enough to get, uh, to get some conclusions I'm going to show in a moment. If this works, actually, the passage that I mentioned before from local to global can be done, and actually you get uh, exactly the same theorem. Without collapsing or vanishing of at least one curve, you have smooth, smoothness of your flow and convergence to a Steiner uh, configuration connecting the points on the boundary of your set. So you always have some collapsing. So to proceed, we you assume you have a collapsing. Now you want to deal with the structural change that I was mentioned before. So we have two situations, curvature is tight bounded or curvature is unbounding in this in doing this. The first is the easiest, as you can imagine, because if the curvature are bounded, your curve are relatively compact in uh, Lipschitz, for instance, because you have Curvature bounding means like uh, C2 bound, so you have, and after the parameterization, uh, Lipschitz compactness, C1 compactness. So you, when you get to the singular time, your network converges somewhere to some limit network that possibly is a mess, possibly is no more regular, 
possibly, one, uh, he has to be non-regular. One curve will shrink to zero, so at least one guy like this could be present. Actually, in this case, because of bounded curvature, you also be able to show that it is unique, so we have a unique limit. And uh, actually, let me also say that uh, if you, we, with bounded curvature, no regions can collapse. Because when a region collapses, you can imagine it less than five uh, uh, edges, as I said before, because more than, s than uh, five edges, six is stable, but more than six, they are enlarging, so no collapsing, so less than five edges. And another uh, easy computation tells you that uh, without, uh, if you have a collapse of a region, your curvature must go to plus infinity, which is are not, which are assuming is not the case. So you get your limit guy. So suppose, for sake of simplicity, that we are not dealing, that the curve collapse is not one of the ones connected to the boundary. It's, let's speak about inner regularity in a way. So a, a real curve, like a, I draw before here, is collapsing. And actually, what we observe, we are able to under, always all this under multiplicity one, conjecture. Then we can actually show that this is exactly the situation. You only get or nothing special, a triple junction or stasis triple junction, or you can get a four point like this with the angles 120, 60. Exactly the situation. Only this case can happen. So if you have a, this is a, after blow up analysis, you find out you have a, only a one possible blow up limit, uh, which is always two lines like that. And looking at, the, at your flow, you are able to conclude that you can only have this situation. So a single situation in this case, a full description of what can happen in bounded curvature, if you assume bounded curvature. OK, as I said, forget about if this, the collapsing curve is one of the boundary, but otherwise, you yeah, don't know. OK, then you get this guy. So the second observation is that after this four point, you open like this. So you want to restart your flow. But the previous theorem cannot be used, because the previous theorem, based on Slonikov theory, only deals with regular networks, or means only triple junction and 120 degrees. Instead, here we have to let evolve something which is as a four junction. So you need a new theorem that unfortunately, okay, fortunately, <laughs> the group uh, Ilman and Elsa Schultz uh, had this uh, wonderful theorem, actually, in my opinion, that they were able to say that uh, if you take uh, any initial network, the more general you can imagine, any kind of multiple junction, any kind of angle between them, only there was only a technical uh, hypothesis that the curves getting to a triple junction cannot have the same tangent. So you don't have cusp situation. You have real positive angles between the curves getting to a multiple junction. They were able to find a flow which is a smooth flow, regular, only triple junction, and went in with for every positive time. And actually, you cannot expect that uh, time zero and positive zero, you have a strong convergence. In fact, uh, actually, it's smooth over a positive time, but in, uh, in general, it's only a bracket flow that possibly several people here know. Kind of uh, geometric measure theory definition of motion by mean curvature. Possibly the first generalized general definition of motion by mean curvature. In particular, is not uh, C1. The continuity, the regularity is not C1 up to time zero. Look, but instead, this is true because actually, look at this. You have this. Uh, this curve is collapsing, and you get this. So the convergence to this limit, as I said before, curvature is bounded. So you have compactness in C1. Is C1 convergence to this limit? But when you restart. And actually, this is getting the detail is what uh, is described by this theorem in this special situation. Here, there is a ju an immediate jump in the corner. For every positive time, here, these 60 degrees angles becomes 120. So this is not C1. It's not a symmetric situation. But in fact, this is smooth flow. 
and this is Braque flow, not C1, a weaker, it's C0, Kuratowski, but not C1 convergent. Morally, it's kind of uh, measure convergence in the tangents, more or less. So, our analysis on this side and this theorem on the other side describe that perfectly in accord with what we have seen under multiplicity one conjecture. Otherwise, this is just. So, if you run the their flow from yeah. a, your initial regular situation, yeah. they say for every positive time, or every. Uh, every positive time is regular. It's one hundred, only triple junction, 120 degrees. So if you run from an already regular situation... Uh, that's that's an open question. <laughs> we all think yes. It coincides with the other. With the one, uh, with the one that we found out uh, directly by PDEs. Yes. Well, uh, no, I wouldn't say open question. You should, if you write it down, I think you can do it. Yeah, but if, if it maintains uh, regularity, it cannot be the same. Because you observed some singular time. Okay, wait, no, but this is small time theorem. Oh, uh, this okay, is yeah, always yeah, post small yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Post small time is the same. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay there is, it's not written down, but we all believe that in that in the regular situation, the two results coincide. Okay. okay, so now we know how to continue the flow in this situation, curvature bounded. And uh, this is better than my drawing. This is what is we call standard transition, so collapse and opening. And this is another example, nicer in my opinion, that we have this theta guy. There is a collapse of this curve, you get this, and then you have this uh, old uh, eyeglasses situation. And then you can imagine that this guy here now going on, this curve for some reason can again collapse down. And you get again something like this with different angles actually, invert this, this will be 120 here, 120 here, 60, 60, and it opens like this. So you could be the, have the phenomenon of oscillation of shape between 1 and 2 for several times. And that it's an open problem if it can happen actually infinitely times. Or the time where you have this can concentrate or so on, it's an open problem. No, no, all of this is under non-uniqueness. There are no, uni no uniqueness theorem in all what we said. Not in the, our existence result and not in this. It's not, there is no unique flow. It's not uniqueness, okay. absolutely. Okay. Even, even, uh, it's even more uh, no weak in yeah, this situation. Yeah. In the other case, it's a matter of uh, regularity of the space where you look for uniqueness. Here, it's really... The theorem, unfortunately, is not so quantitative. It's extracting, extracting uh, subsequence of flow till you find out the right bracket flow, without pos well, partially without estimates, which is a problem that we would like to have a better, stronger result with estimates in the, the flow, the bracket flow that you find out by this theorem. Actually. There is a way to continue the flow by not. Yeah, yeah. But, but we expect that generically you have uniqueness. But uh, as I said to you, with the diagonals of a square, well, it's a static situation. But, well, suppose you perturb it a little, but you can expect that you open this direction, open the other direction, so there could be an example of you know, no uniqueness. We expect no uniqueness in very, but non generically. We expect generically in initial data, you have uniqueness. But this is a very far, in my opinion, open problem up to now. Okay, let, second situation, situation you have curvature unbounded. Well, second situation, some curves are, are going away and curvature is bounded. Again, block methods, but now the, there are two problems. First, uh, you're not able to get a unique limit when t goes to, be, to the singular time. A unique network here. And also you cannot have uniqueness of your blow up. Moreover, the blow up here can be a lot, even if you assume uh, multiplicity one. Classification is an open problem. 
and uh, the local structure, as you can imagine, influence the possible blow up. For instance, if you have a tree, you can only the complexity taking a blow up cannot increase. So if you are your network is a tree, your blow up will be a tree. And tree blow up blow, uh, shrinker, which are a tree, are classified, for instance. So in special situations, you can also deal with the case with the curvature is unbounded. And actually, for instance, if we still have multiplicity one and you are dealing with a tree, actually the curvature cannot be bounded because by means of this argument you get a contradiction. You classify your blow up, you see that they are, they are only the same one of the previous situation. That means uh, you can infer from that, that the curvature could not be bounded, you find a contradiction. So actually when you have a free, this situation simply doesn't be there. In a way, if you have a tree, your regions cannot collapse. There are no regions, simply. So you are in the previous case. So for a tree, you have a full description under multiplicity one conjecture of your flow. Collapsing only this, only standard transition, then reopening this way. And then you can start uh, uh, asking yourself more complicated questions like the one about the geometry, if you can have uh, oscillation of shape infinite times, for instance, or concentration of singular time, or converging at infinity to something. Instead, in fact, uh, more or less, you can conclude that the bounded curvature more or less is uh, equivalent to no collapse of regions. When you have instead really regions, it's a under this conjecture, if you have uniqueness of your limit, actually you have a multiple guy, uh, multiplicity, uh, a network with uh, multiple points, uh, or triple junction without one identity condition, which is covered by that theorem. Then you can restart. The Sorry, <laughs> you can restart again by means of that theorem actually. But we, uh, let me tell you, even if we have this, the control on what's happening is less, less uh, precise. Here we have a really precise and full description of this transition. In general situation, it's less precise, actually. And as I said, the natural uh, Next question, after you are able, we are able to do all this, it's asking, for instance, if the number of singular time is finite. So you expect, if you look at the simulation I didn't write it, that the complexity of your network is decreasing, in a way. Regions are going away, curves disappearing. Usually, after a restarting, you don't get new regions or too many new curves. Look at this. For instance, you only get one curve, so at least from here to here, complexity is, we can discuss if it is the same or less. And length, total length is decreasing, so there should be some quantity, mixed geometric combinatorial quantity that is decreasing during, your, during the flow. That prevents uh, the fact that singular times uh, uh, can be infinite or concentrating. Actually, or, or not discrete. We, well, the, the, the weak conjecture is that the singular time are discrete. The strong conjecture is that they are actually finite. At some point, the structure of your network stabilize and converge to the minimal connection between the points on the boundary. This I already told you. The only, well, the main problem of multiplicity one conjecture, we only were able to prove <laughs> with <laughs> very Low, stra low complexity networks, only with two triple junction around. There are several, and uh, in this case, you can have a full analysis. There are several. One, these are more or less uh, that were all, all, all studied. One um, single, uh, one triple junction here. This is what is called bracket spoon, actually. These are eyeglasses, broken eyeglasses, and uh, this is theta. This is a Steiner and um, so these are more or less all the all the possible topological structure and uh, they can be fully analyzed in the flow with the open problem of uh, the, the the discrete set the, the fact that the time of singularity are finite or the oscillation of shape phenomenon. So let me conclude uh, 
with the open problem and search directions. Well, uh, as I mentioned several times, there are several uniqueness issues around and what we hope is a kind of generic uniqueness result that is, in my opinion, very far at the moment, but uh, should be there. Multiplicity and conjecture and the same uniqueness of the blow-up limit network a singular time that this is not necessary for if you deal with a tree. But if you want to deal with the general case, you have to, you have to prove also this. So recent, well, uh, if, uh, if you heard me speaking about these things, uh, months ago I was more confident in being able to, to prove this one, but instead recently I'm more confident <laughs> I changed my mind. We changed our mind. <laughs> we are more confident in finding a proof for the multiplicity one conjecture that at least will set the case, interesting case of the trees. Stronger estimating of starting theorem, as I told you, it's partially non-quantitative, the theorem of restarting, and having quantitative estimate, more, del more stronger, uh, stronger uh, quantitative estimate in the starting theory will affect also the conclusion about the time, the number of time of singularity, because it will be possible to use it to say that uh, there is, uh, a, you cannot have a singularity immediately too, too soon after another singularity will give you some time of relax between another change of, uh, of structure. And the same uh, finite singular time. This is more technical because related to the blow up. Actually, the main goal would be do two dimensional in R3. Okay. Double bubble, it's the easiest case. A cluster of bubbles would be the super main goal, but uh, well, the easiest case is the bu double bubble. The general case is even more complicated because you can have stratification on three level surfaces, interface, one dimensional interfaces where three surfaces arrive and points with several. Uh, think of the interior of, uh, of a tetrahedron with the carbon atoms. You can have all these uh, surfaces arriving and stratification with these points where they can see four regions arriving there. So the, all these guys must move according to the, so the, your system becomes more complicated and actually at the moment uh, only for situations like double bubble around there is only the short time existence and uniqueness in the special classes uh, by Deppner, Garke, Kostasa and instead the short time existence a stronger uh, theorem we estimate here is more or less with not uh, Several estimates here, there are estimates on the curvature for, again, special initial interfaces, interfaces like double bubble, not interfaces where you have four guys coming, as I say. So there is no level zero stratification of your interfaces. And that's all for the moment. And uh, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you for this nice talk. There is some question? Um, I was as curious, I was as curious about the first picture, the first uh, animation that you show us, uh -huh. and <laughs> uh, and uh, you mentioned that in fact uh, uh, many things are hard to be explained from the mathematical point of view. So the fact that you have this region with less than six uh, well, size, that, that no, that's that's the the only one that which is uh, rigorous. It's easier. So you can you can show that uh, if you have uh, less than uh, six, yes. uh, you compute it's a uh, one dimensional Gauss Bonnet. Ah, okay, you, yes, you simply yes, right. you write down the time derivative of the area. You know the corners, 120. Ah, you, you use the geometric invariance. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, and uh, you, you integrate the curvature and you find out that six uh, uh, regions with six edges, the area, the time derivative of the area is zero. More okay. increasing, more positive, less than six uh, negative. Simply. But uh, I mean, in general, for the other problem, uh, is that so? Because you mathematically formulate uh, the, the problem just taking the curve and writing the parabolic system. Is there any way to so? Since uh, indeed you show us uh, this picture where you more than the curve you see surfaces, so the piece bounded by the curves. Is there any way or whatever to uh, considering some kind of currents? And writing a PDE for current, so just making the op so what you don't see, 
uh, in the system. You see curves. You don't see uh, the region that is bounded by the curve. Is there any mathematical way to transfer what we see indeed in the picture? We, in the picture, we see more the, the piece of area instead of curves, like oriented currents, and you sum that, and you write some system for the cars, but it's just a very vague and... Well, the, the, the motion is driven by the curvature on the interfaces, so... Mm. The region, you don't see anything from the PDE point of view in the region, so... No, there are several... Yes. There, yes. Are, there are several... Um, the weak definition adapted to this special situation. Kind of minimizing movement, there are some work of uh, Tim Laux and Felix Otto, uh, bracket flow for starting from the beginning, bracket flow for the for the networks. Uh, uh, I don't think there is level sets flow because level sets uh, it doesn't work very well with this situation. But uh, okay, they all give something. The point is that uh, the more you are close to PDEs, the best you get uh, detailed regularity results. The m best you understand singularity formation, because this, all these uh, definition of flows are in classes which are weak objects, like uh, very false for bracket ah, okay, flow. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. moreover, the, the minimizing movement approach, uh, I know it's not fully implemented at the moment. So, uh, well, you lose a lot taking compactness. Uh, well, you know, mismatch, you discretize time, you take minimization, then you pass the. So you mean that in this approach zero. they do not consider curves but very false and some in bracket. Yes. In bracket, yeah, in bracket. It's yeah, ah, yes, that's emotional very approach, false. Yes. And then uh, since they are very false, well, it's more delicate to find out uh, regularity results and description of singularity formation. Okay, yes. In some sense, now you we, pay we the try price, to stay yes. very close to the to the classical approach in order to have uh, the most precise. Uh, Sorry, I have just uh, one uh, very small and quick curiosity. But is there any? Cap maybe you have. You could even already mention in your talk. But <laughs> so, is there any way? So after the singular, after the shock. Is there any case where you are certainly sure that uh, after this time you have a unique way to proceed, or you decide in some sense, or you assume like uh, the uh, one uh, well, multiplicity we, conjecture? We, we and when I say we, means me, Matteo, Alessandra, and Felix Schulz, uh, Tom and mm -hmm. We think that uh, w one can push their proof in that theory into this special case that this uh, should be uh, unique. You should be able to show that in this case their flow is unique. In this Assuming the case. multiplicity one conjecture? Well, that, that you need it. Well, multiplicity okay. one conjecture, you use it up to here. This part, well, you, you assume that you have this, and then you want to see what happens. And in this special case of this special guy, you should be able to push a little their proof in order to prove uniqueness. But in, only in this special case. Only in this special case. And some other, but not in general. Thank you. Yeah, technical uh, question is um, so when the points uh, collapse and uh, when they leave each other, is the speed uh, finite? No. Do you know? No. No. Uh, the curve. The, you, you should see something like a concentrated curvature there. That uh, sp uh, sp speed uh, these, these two guys in this direction at infinitesimally infinite at time zero. Uh, the curve, well, the, the velocity here. If you if you draw the the maximum of the curvature, well, here this is time t. This is a t larger and t smaller. Oh, then you have a delta in curvature. Okay. If you time, if you do it, yeah, the, f the curvature goes to here to sum because, as I told you, here curvature is bounded, and then comes from plus infinity. Okay. Immediate. So the speed should be finite before collapsing, yeah. but infinite after. Infinite, yeah. It opens with infinite velocity. So maybe when and the speed uh, is and not... And what I said, the stronger estimates is that I would like to have better comprehension of okay. what happens to curvature close to zero here. That at the moment, it's simply coming to plus infinity. Almost no estimate at all. Okay. So maybe when the speed uh, of collapse is not infinitesimal, then you should have uniqueness, I guess. Sorry? When the speed of collapse is yeah. not uh, infinitesimal, 
maybe then you should have uniqueness, I guess. Well, here the speed of collapse is uh, is uh, finite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm saying not uh, infinitesimal. So when it's uh, bounded away from zero, it's from zero. This speed, I don't I think guess, so. I guess, yeah. I mean, if if it's straight, it doesn't move. So you need a bit of curvature to make them uh, really collapse, right? I don't think you can have speed of collapse zero here. But well, it's not. A <laughs> I'm not sure, but. Seems very strange. Or uh, I'm saying bounded away from zero. So bounded away from zero. Well, I don't know. But I would prefer. Well, what we hope is that for special structure here, non-symmetric, you should have existence. If you have this, or a pentagon, well, uh, if you have some symmetry, you should lose. Uh, more or less, this should be the. Okay. But I, I maybe you're right. I cannot relate it to the speed of collapse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In this case, the speed of collapse is uh, plus infinity. This is the only case with speed finite speed of collapse. But uh, okay, this is. Well, at the moment we are we have no clear idea about these questions. Okay, we can thank the Carlo. Ten minutes. Oh well, you, you have to test. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. This one, right?
magari quella generica quando hai il basso sulla velocità della collisione allora Alessio, ah? with Alessio Fidani. Ah, okay. okay, now we will uh, have um, Joaquin Serra from ETH and uh, he will speak about generic smoothness in free boundary problems. Okay, thank you and, and thank you very much to the organizers for, for the invitation. So, i will speak about generic smoothness, essentially for the Stef Stefan problem and the obstacle problem. And a bit of outline of the talk, but it's not a serious outline, it's more a, prop a propaganda slide. That to prove generic smoothness for the Stefan problem that I will introduce in the next slide, is the problem about the evolution of ice water interface, we will need to To, to develop fine results on the singular set of the classical obstacle problem. That is another very well known uh, free boundary problem that I will also introduce in detail. And to do, to, to do these fine results on the singular set, we need to rely on a link of the solutions near the singular set with the two-valued harmonic functions or the Signorini problem of it. Um, that is, a, that it's, it's, we, we will use uh, techniques for, uh, from this um, Almgren theory of two-valued harmonic functions. Uh, so from co-dimension uh, uh, higher than one minimal surfaces, right? So the Stefan, the Stefan problem, it's a very classical uh, free boundary problem. Um, that dates back to 1831, apparently, and describes a temperature distribution in an ice water interface. So you have a container, you have a block of ice that is held at temperature zero, so it has temperature zero. And then the assumption, I, I will denote theta the temperature. And now we have very simple assumptions, positive temperature on the water, zero temperature on ice, some boundary conditions, the heat equation on the water, where the temperature is positive, and then uh, the difficulty, of course, of the problem is that the, um, the region where you have water or the region where, where you have ice shrinks, so the ice is melting, so ice becomes water, so the domain of the equation changes with time, 
and the condition that tells you how the domain changes oops, is this one is that the velocity of the, um, the interface is proportional uh, to the gradient of the temperature that is essentially like Fourier law, right? Or not. And okay, this problem um, I don't know how to deal with it, but there is a classical transformation that is called the Dubai transformation that is that when you consider just the integral in time of the temperature. This, this is just the integral between 0 and t of theta of xs ds, so very simple quantity. This is a new function u of x and t. This is a kind of accumulated temperature. And this solves um, the parabolic obstacle problem. So now we, do, we will introduce more this, but the, um, the parabolic obstacle problem is this problem here that um, in a way, is um, ah, and one important observation is that this problem, so the solution u, the zero set of u is the same as the zero set of theta. So you, you can pass from one to an, another, but also if you want to understand the dynamics of the of the ice uh, region, you can just uh, consider um, this problem and study how the zero set moves, right? And this problem has some nice features like this is a variational inequality and you can prove um, existence and uniqueness and this kind of, so that it's well posed given some boundary conditions that come of course from integrating these boundary conditions. So now the main question in this problem that translates immediately to the to the Stefan problem is that what is the regularity of the solution you to this problem, so the accumulated temperature if you want, but also the difficult question I would say is that what is the regularity of the interface of the free boundary, I will call the, so, so the, the, the ice will start to shrink and maybe here, like in, we saw like in maybe in mean curvature flows, right, this, these two, uh, um, these two parts will touch and there will be a singularity, so how many singularities can you have? This is the generic question uh, for um, we would like to to answer, right? Okay. Um, no. Now, first uh, simplification, but then I will remove this simplification. So I'm, I'm not. I'm just uh, doing now this simplification to explain things because here um, with the parabolic problem there is uh, much more involved. So if you consider the, the stationary problem, let's call this again Stefan, Stefan problem because it's essentially equivalent. If you consider the stationary version of this, of this one, this is the classical obstacle problem. And you see the, so when, when u is constant in time, the solutions, they solve this very simple problem. So it's just the equation, it's very like innocent, right? u is a non-negative function Let's, let's say u goes from b1 to r, so, so from b1 to r, but takes non-negative values. And the equation is that the Laplacian of u is of course zero where u is zero, so it's, uh, but where u is positive is, is one, right? Is the characteristic function of u positive. This is the, the, the equation, right? So it's an extremely simple equation uh, to write down. And if you want, this is, it, it, the only motivation is not the, the Stefan problem, it comes also from many other places, like this one. If you want, is the, the, um, the model for um, the, the height in an elastic surface that lies above towards a uh, horizontal plane and is subject to gravity. So you can, the, the solution of the problem, you can obtain as a minimizer of this very simple functional, like the Dirichlet energy plus B, uh, with prescribed boundary conditions. And um, you, you have also motivations like in finance uh, or um, uh, like uh, stochastic control, 
like the, um, the American options pricing, this, these are well known. Also in, uh, well not this, with one as a right hand side you have this motivation, but here in general you can put, instead of putting one as a right hand side, so the characteristic function, you can put f times the characteristic function, and f will be a smooth positive function. And this comes um, in applications uh, when you study this, what is called the Frostman equilibrium measure for Coulomb interactions, and something similar appears or in, in the theory of random matrix as well. You have many, many applications, and people care about this problem, right? Um, so one thing, one, I said this thing of the F, that you can put an F here. So all of the things I will say with a one, uh, so we, with this characteristic function, that is the one that appears in here, you can put an F. And this is a bit important because, for instance, in the plane, if you put just a one or an analytic function, you, you can use complex variables and things, but if you start to use too much this, that this is analytic, the techniques will never pass to, not even the parabolic with a one, because you are using complex variables and structures, and, and you cannot uh, use for the, um, problems that you, you really want to solve. So you can do this simplification, but being aware that the methods have to be general enough, right? But this will be the case, and when, when it's not the case, I will, I will explain, right? Um, and we have the same main question, so what is the regularity of the solution? That is an easier question, I will answer this. Now, and what is the regularity of the free boundary? So this, the boundary of the set where u is positive, right? So about the regularity of the solution, this, um, uh, the precise answer was known f uh, since many years ago, and uh, you, you have that the solution has bounded, but not continuous, because the question already tells you that the uh, has bounded a uh, second derivative, but not continuous, because the equation already tells you that the second derivatives will be discontinuous, right? They jump from one, the Laplacian jumps from one to zero. So, but they are bounded, so this is, this is nice. And also, this is like a, a control, um, uh, well, let me say, uh, and, and also there is a degeneracy, that is, if you have, let me draw maybe, a picture. So in, in, like, if this is the plane, in, uh, so this is the plane, and this is r, so this is the, um, my function u. So the function u will look like, you will have a contact set where u is zero, and then the function u probably will look like, like, like a bowl, or, or, we will see more pictures, but, at least to understand this, have in mind this picture in two dimensions, like the contact set will be something like this, and then the function is satisfies Laplacian equal one, so it is like sort of in average uh, convex, right? So this is the kind of picture. And what I'm doing here is like um, a, a picture on how is the solution near a point, so that this, if I look from above, uh, the contact set will be something like this. It can be many uh, complicated things, but the, uh, still, just to understand the pictures I will make, the contact set will be something like this, and then the solution would, would be going up, right? And this is, the non-degeneracy tells you that if I centered a, a ball in a free boundary point, so in a point uh, in the boundary of U positive, so this is U positive, and this is a free boundary point, then the supremum of u in the ball of radius r is comparable to r squared. So the control by above is given by the C11 regularity. So you can separate at most r squared, right? But the control by below is also important, that at some point you are comparable to r, to r squared, right? And this allows us to consider um, blow-ups that will, will be the, the main tool to study the regularity for this problem, as 
we see in the in the in the previous talk, right? And in many programs, right? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so sorry. Okay, if we take a free boundary point, we can consider the rescale function just u of x0 plus rx. So we are zooming in uh, around x0, and then we multiply by r to the minus 2 because we want something of size 1. Now these functions vanish at the origin. Their supremum is 1, is comparable to 1. So in particular, they don't degenerate. And also their Hessian, just this uh, computation at any point x, is just the Hessian of, um, of u because the r square compensates with this r square. And then this is bounded. So this is a sequence of functions that are C11. So this sequence is pretty compact, right? You, you can just um, consider the accumulation points of this set of functions. And now we want to say something about what are the possible accumulation points, right? Now, um, this, uh, to say what are the possible accumulation points and what are the consequences of uh, classifying the possible accumulation points, this took much more years and uh, was mo uh, more complicated. But uh, many examples uh, before um, um, Caffarelli mainly did the positive results that I will describe in, in one second. Um, many examples of solutions were known. And in the examples, so they had many, many examples of solutions. And in the examples, you observe always two types of behaviors, right? You have either, either a regular point that is what by definition, where the free boundary is is smooth, or the where the blow up of the of the contact set u equals zero is a half space, and near a free boundary point. So this is the contact set. Um, if you start to zoom in and rescale in this way, u of x zero plus r x divided r square. This looks more and more as this shape, very simple shape that is just like this one. E this is, uh, there is some direction, and this is e dot x squared, and here there is missing a positive part. I will write it here. So this, is, is this 1D functional, 1D function? Is this just e dot x positive part squared over 2, right? This is the, what you see at regular points. And you have another t type of points that are m much more intricate that are the singular points, where the contact set, and this exists, so um, they had many examples of this, and even um, a lot, uh, countably many of these, and very weird um, structures. Um, so in a singular point nearby, the, free, um, the, the condition is that the, free bound, the um, contact set has a cusp, but it could be many types of cusp, it could be in the examples like this, one-sided cusp, two-sided cusp, like this in the plane, or in R3 or R4, we will see many more possibilities. I will describe in R3 at least. But in the plane, you would see, for instance, in this case, you see um, this uh, type of contact set. When you zoom in, the contact set becomes one line, not a half space, right? When you zoom in, becomes one line. And the picture is like this. When you start to zoom in, the function rescale starts to look look more and more um, like a paraboloid. Here is a positive part of this, here is a paraboloid. And the paraboloid in many dimensions you could have, and there are examples, um, any matrix here with trace equal one. So need, need, uh, I don't need to say that these are of course solutions of the obstacle problem because they are not negative, they touch at one point or at a line or at, a, at, at some linear space. And the trace of A is one, so the Laplacian of this function is one. So they are solutions, right? Of course, when, when you, yes. Yeah, yeah, you, you, it's a variational equality and to prove existence and, and uniqueness. To prove 
context. Yeah, yeah, it's it's easy. It's easy. Well, in this, then you have to prove existence in a class. Of okay, okay. So, but to prove some existent result and uniqueness in certain class is not, okay. not the issue. It's more the, the regular. Okay. So now in R3, in 3D, the possible contract sets, depending on how is this um, blow up uh, polynomial, this is near a singular point, you can have two possible contract sets in, or two interesting ones. You could have also like one isolated point. But imagine this would be like a contract set that becomes very thin. And when you blow up, you see, in this, when you blow up, this becomes an axis. And this corresponds to this polynomial that is 1 quarter x1 squared plus x2 squared. And instead this one, the contact set would be like this, like more like a, a flat thing like this. When you blow up, it's a plane, right? So the, there is a, like a zoology of, of behaviors in the singular points. Now, the positive results came um, the very important ones in 1977 with this uh, theorem of Caffarelli that is called the, the dichotomy, uh, Caffarelli's dichotomy, that, and he says uh, that if uh, zero is a free boundary point, then uh, you have a dichotomy re really between the regular or the singular behavior. So either uh, a neighborhood of zero, in a neighborhood of zero, the free boundary is analytic, or um, zero is singular, and this means that um, the boundary of U intersected with BR is contained in a is trapped in a very um, in a very uh, uh, narrow band, right? So if this is R, the distance is R, the size of the band is little over of R, but just with some little low, let's say, abstract, no one no, uh, knew how to quantify this, right? Um, because it's, it's a proof by blow up and compactness, and so it's, it's, it's something abstract. And then, um, about the singular points, you have to wait. Um, so, so because in, in this result, you see that um, you just say that the contact set is trapped but this band, for instance, may depend on the scale. So this is a very like, soft um, compactness um, information. So maybe strap in some scale in, in here, and then uh, this could rotate. But then uh, you can do better, but it took some years. In dimension two, you ca um, the same year, uh, you could do much better in dimension two. You can prove that the rescale function that we are always considering, minus the limit polynomial, this goes to zero with a modulus of continuity that you can quantify. And this essentially tells you that the blow-up is, is unique, that the, uh, like this blow-up doesn't depend on the sequence, right? Because when, when we have a pre-compact sequence, we have many possible limits, right? But the, in this, in dimension two, we have a modulus of continuity that this a log epsilon modulus, so a very, very weak modulus of continuity, but we have something. But in higher dimensions, um, um, you have to wait until 1998, some, some years later, that Caffarelli proves that, um, that the same is true for some abstract modulus of continuity. So n impossible to quantify, so it exists a modulus of continuity so, such that this is true. right? So the U rescale is close to the limit. And this in particular gives the uniqueness of the blow-ups and the continuity of the blow-ups. Um, so this means the map that sends X0 to the, uh, the blow-up P at this point, this map is continuous, right? So as a corollary of this continuity, what you can prove is a, a st stratification of the singular set and let me introduce just, uh, I will use very few notation, but this is important. So sigma is the singular set, is the set of singular points that remember is where, um, where the contact set has some cusp, so where, or where it, it is not smooth. And sigma m will be the points in the singular set, 
such that the dimension of the, um, this p star, remember, is a quadratic polynomial. So p star equals zero, the zero set of p star is a linear space. And this can have any dimension between zero and n minus one. N cannot be because the, the Laplacian of p st, um, the Laplacian of p star is one, so it cannot be fully um, zero. But uh, the dimension, this m can be a number, the dimension between one and uh, m minus one. And this set sigma n, sigma m, you can say by this abstract modulus of continuity that is contained in a C1 m-dimensional manifold, right? But so you have the illustration of this stratification is that the singular set, and you can you don't prove that it's that this piecewise a C1 m-dimensional manifold. You could, you prove only that it's contained. So in examples with same infinite right hand sides, you can have a Cantor set of of a curve, like, so the negative results um, are strong, um, so there are many. So um, one has to be careful when putting positive ones. So, so every sigma could, uh, could happen, also sigma zero. Yeah, sigma zero is not very interesting because it's when the, uh, um, is a ball like this, when they blow up, and then it's isolated points. So the sigma zero and around sigma, the points of sigma zero, the solution is analytic, so, um, so the sigma zero is like the one that is easy to study. So you want you care about sigma one to sigma n minus one, right? And and the stratification is like this. You may have some pieces where the singular set is contained, like in a plane. But it could be like this would be uh, the contact set here will be th uh, could be thick. So th these are regular points. You see the blow up. But then you could have a like a plane, um, the contact set could go to like, like a, a plane of singular points, and they and it's very critical because they could have the same dimension. So this could have have the dimension two, the same as the regular points. So it could be singular in many many points, right? And here you may have a curve that is sigma one and sigma zero. This in dimension three is all that can happen, and always this would be subsets of this thing with, in principle, very complicated geology and, the uh, 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 zoology. and the idea of the proof of this result is to use the Whitney extension theorem, so just because uh, you can do, um, uh, just to comment, because it's not so mysterious, when you have like a modulus of continuity of x sends to p star x0, this is equivalent to saying that the function u, that the solution u is, uh, has second derivatives uh, continuous on the singular set. Uh, that is a closed set, right? And then you extend this uh, function u, you extend it to a, a function capital U, and then uh, you find that um, the z on, the, um, on, the contact set, on, the, on the singular set, du, D capital U vanishes, and D to U, you know its kernel, because D to U will coincide with P on these points. So, and then using the implicit function theorem, so you just find the function like this using Whitney, so black box, and then um, you use the implicit function theorem and you prove the stratification, that's it, right? Okay, but of course, if you know this, we said this is a continuity. If you know a better modulus of continuity, like if this map x0 to p star x0 was Lipschitz, the manifold would not be C1. The Whitney, in the Whitney, we could, we could go, we would have a modulus of continuity like CR, and then we could prove like C11. Right? This is, this is what, what I'm going to do here. So there is, a, uh, very quickly, there is like a chain of implications when you prove that when you can prove like a model of continuity like that, that you rescaled is close to the blow up with a model of continuity, then by the triangle inequality you control the difference of the piece by essentially the same model of continuity up to putting constant and constant. And then this tells you that you restricted to the singular set is of class C2 omega tilde. Omega tilde is this model, new model of continuity. And then sigma m, 
uh, will, be, will be contained in a C1 omega m-dimensional manifold. And this works you, when you replace here by a new modulus of continuity, when you know better information, you obtain a better result, right? This is a, I say because, so now what were uh, the best known quantitative result about how U is close to the blow up? So as I said in dimension two, the only uh, the, there was the only quantitative result for many years um, was a, a logarithmic, very weak mod modulus of continuity in dimension two. Then um, there is this paper of 91 uh, of Sakai, and he obtains the, what is the optimal modulus of continuity. But this paper, the thing is that it uses the complex st structure. It uses complex variables, essentially, analytic functions in 2D. So the bad news, this is excellent and actually has very powerful results for exactly the two-dimensional problem with right-hand side one, but you have no hope to extend this to Stefan problem or to the problems that we would like to. So just it's a two-dimensional result, very nice, but it tells you what what is the optimal thing to expect? So in, in two dimensionals and for the st stationary problem, you understand very well thanks to complex variables and it tells you what is the optimal thing to, st to expect that is omega of r equals c of r. So from here to here, there is a lot of room to improvement. And then Bayes, in this paper of 1999, also in 2D, but with a much more flexible, uh, flexible method, a variational method that is uh, using the, um, his, uh, what is called a bias adjusted energy and an epipenometric inequality. In two dimensions, he can improve these modulus of continuity to see R to the alpha for some alpha. But I mean, this seems weaker, but actually it's very interesting because this is much more flexible, right? And then the more recent result that is from uh, last year was that in every dimension, so it's like this, but now in every dimension. You can put omega of r, a log modulus of continuity. In every dimension, three, four, five, etc. Right? Okay, and you can think from, uh, and this is also a, a very, uh, so this is also using this bias approach, and of course it's much more flexible than this, and it's in every dimension, so it's good news. But still, from log to one, there is a big gap. Okay, but now in the next slide, just let me tell you now, we will see that if you want to do it in any point, this log is optimal, right? But we will see that you also have positive results in this direction. So now the, the new results are as follows. This is a to recall all the notations, so we have a solution of the obstacle problem, sigma m was a, so if you forgot one of the uh, things, you can, everything is contained in here. So the theorem with Alessio Figali, um, also from ETH, um, that, that is uh, very recent, well, not so, but I mean, uh, it's still, it's still not, not published, but submitted. Um, says that for in two dimensions, we can get the same as a Sakai result, so omega of r is CR, but now we don't use the, so it, this is a flexible proof, so it uses two dimensions, it's an, in every singular point, but we don't use the complex variables and, and you can perturb this, right? And we prove something a bit more precise that this sigma one, the um, sigma one is this stratum here, is contained in a C2 curve. So not only C11, that is when you prove this modulus of continuity, that, that is the optimal one. You cannot do better than this because there are examples that this is the optimal. But you can prove the C1, so that the, um, the C11, that the second derivative, uh, the C2, that the second derivative that the curvature match well, right? And then for n equal, uh, less, uh, greater or equal than three, we reprove the Columbus polar Belikov modulus of continuity, so log one over r minus epsilon for every point, for every singular point. And we show with a counterexample that this is optimal. Right? So this is at generic points, 
Uh, so at, at every point, this is the most you can prove. But now, the more, maybe more interesting results is that we can prove that generically things are much better. Right? We can prove that omega, uh, the, this, the modulus of continuity is like a power, r to the alpha n, for every x0 in the maximal stratum. The maximal stratum is the one in R3, is the sigma 2, is the one that worries you, you are more concerned about, about it because it could be as large as a plane, as a, as a two-dimensional thing, right? So we can prove that there you have a, a improved modulus of continuity where this alpha n is, there is a conjecture in this respect um, that probably is optimal and is, the, um, is defined like um, the minimum homogeneity such that you have a certain solution um, of Signorini problem in Rn, right? Whatever, we will come back to this. But then, uh, um, apart from this that is valid in every point, so in the maximal stratum you, you don't have this, you have better, C alpha with this alpha, um, there is a partition, there is the generic points and the anomalous points. Okay, the anomalous points will have co-dimension, so this is an n-1 dimensional thing, right? So the, the anomalous points what we, uh, that we define, but uh, I, I won't enter in the definition, the anomalous points have co-dimension 2. So it's a very small set. They have co-dimension 2. This is n-1, so this is n-3. And outside of this set, omega and, and this generic, it's what we call the generic points, are a closed subset. So in this closed subset that has um, this very, very large, um, we have the optimal models of continuity. So up to removing these bad points that you control the house door dimension, you have the optimal. And uh, for the, the intermediate stratum, for m uh, less or equal than n minus 2, what you have is that uh, sigma n also has a partition like this. In the generic points, you have the optimal models of continuity. And the anomalous points, we have a, a Hausdorff dimensional bound that they are co-dimension 1. So, like here, sigma 1, we have a closed set of sigma 1 that is contained in a C11 manifold, and we have the optimal models of continuity in this closed set. But then, there can be sigma 1 um, here um, when 1 minus 1 is 0, we can prove discrete, right? L like, mm. So uh, in, in sigma 1, for instance, we prove that the set of this anomalous, uh, set of anomalous points is discrete, right? Okay, this seems... Mm. Now we care about... So this is an uh, illustration so, so of how would be the context set. Sorry. But, yeah. Not now. In five minutes, you will have to. No, generically, it just means that uh, we can bound the the the, um, the points um, such that these do not happen, and they they are they have co-dimension like two here and one here. Okay. So let me skip this one. And now, these results are seem a bit the positive results seem a bit strange, but they are optimal, right? They are optimal in this sense. Well, we don't know, for the maximal stratum, we don't know, but you have the conjecture that the, the alpha that we prove is optimal, and there are many results to, to believe, and there, there is a natural characterization. But for, for the other stratum, like in R3, I said sigma 1, the normal points of sigma 1 could be a discrete set, but we can construct an actually symmetric solution of the obstacle problem that has an anomalous point at the origin in R3. So really, you prove that it is zero-dimensional and you have examples with zero-dimensional. And this in any, for every M and N, you can construct these examples. So the, um, the dimensional bounds on the anomalous set are sharp, uh, at least up to the maximal stratum, but probably two in the maximal stratum. Okay. Um, just let me check how much time. Um, okay, about 12 minutes. So be, before giving 
um, some ideas from the proof of this result, let me just introduce very quickly the, what is the, the Signorini problem. The, senior pro the Signorini problem is you take um, a function, you minimize the Dirichlet energy with some boundary conditions among functions that um, on, on, the, on the plane xn equals zero are non-negative, right? So it's like, it's called the thin obstacle problem. So imagine that you have a vertical half uh, space like this, the green one, and then you put like a boundary conditions and you lower the thing until it touches here. So here you can have some singularity like this, right? And, and, and you will have a contact set. And outside the function will be analytic because it's harmonic. This is the type of solution. Well, these solutions have, when, when and, and we find exactly this with, this is the zero obstacle problem. So the, the obstacle is like a line, really. It's, it's a line in, in 3D. It's, it's flat. This could be curved or, two or whatever, but here it's a line. And this is what we will find. In this very particular situation, there is a trick that you can reflect this picture so this is a graph of a function. If you reflect it, if, um, if you reflect it and, and consider the union of the two graphs, this is a two-valued harmonic function, right? In this very particular case, but you can prove this. And then there is actually um, to solve this problem, the Signorino problem, they used a lot of tools that came from minimal surfacing, higher co-dimension, uh, and um, so the, the key elements in the regularity of the Signorini problem, so the, one of the most important is that uh, what is the Almgren frequency formula that is original for two valued harmonic functions or for, um, that tells you that the Dirichlet energy of the rescaled function, uh, omega r is just, you take your solution, uh, you take your solution and you rescale br to be one, just you zoom in. So, um, this quantity here that is, um, is, is monotone non-decreasing in R, okay? Uh, is this, yes. And this implies that the blow-ups, well, you can do blow-ups and the blow-ups will be homogeneous. And this is super useful for the scenario problem and for the two-valued harmonic functions. So now, um, the relation with the scenario problem will, will come soon, but uh, let me just say um, what we what the first approach to the problem we said it was to consider what we call the first blow up. To just you know the u of r x if zero is a singular point, let's say zero is a singular point, you consider u r to the minus one u of r x. The L2 norm is comparable to one. You pass to the limit and you find the p star. This is the definition of p star. Is the first blow up. And then what the natural thing to do, okay, if we want to obtain more information, we can subtract p star. So you, we can say uh, u minus p star and try to divide it by its size, more or less, and try to see if you converge to something. This is natural, but of course, this is a very nonlinear problem. There are many interrogants here. In principle, so this is obvious to try this, but um, what is not obvious is that you can really do it, right? Um, but there is a magic here, somehow happening, that if, is you, if you consider this W, that is U minus P star, you rescale it to send B, BR to, um, to B1, and you divide by its L to norm, the map R to, this is wrong, sorry, this is an important typo. So the, if you, the map R to um, gradient of W tilde R uh, square L2 in, B1, in the boundary in B1, so this is wrong, this is this. So R, the map R to the norm L2 of gradient W R square, uh, this is monotone non-decreasing. And this is, this is actually Almgren's frequency formula, somehow. <laughs> Just that it's surprising that here it's monotone and decreasing. Actually, there are, like in the proof, it's a, it's a bit longer, right? And, and there are some cancellation there that 
that this is exactly monotone, right? And then, okay, you can blow up, <coughs> you can solve these intervals, and you converge to, to some function that turns out to be a solution of the Signorini problem. That's why. And then if you know information about the Signorini, about the Signorini problem, you start to deduce things about um, the um, about the singular set because this this blow up you can do at every singular point. Essentially, what you want to know, so the a, a better um, uh, modulus of continuity will be related to obtaining here the bl the blow up that will be a homogeneous function. The higher is the homogeneity, the homogeneity, the better. Right? For instance, in dimension 2, the, the possible homogeneities of the Signorini problem, the solutions are classified, and you know that the possible, uh, the possible homogeneities um, that I are higher than 2 are 3, 3.5, uh, 4, uh, 5, and 5.5, and etc. So you have like you, you have like a gap, if you can exclude homogeneity 2, so this is, was like too, homog too homogeneous at the origin. So it's weird that the blow up is again too homogeneous. But this happens at the anomalous points. But at most points, through dimension reduction arguments, whatever, you can manage to prove that there is a gap, that you, you cannot have the same homogeneity, you jump up, and in general you jump in the lower stratum, you jump to 3, but in the higher stratum, um, in the higher stratum, you, you have these solutions to Signorino, you have many more possibilities in high dimension, right? So you, you need to do this, this is um, a lot of thing, but, and now just, let me just comment that when you have this Q, then you can say, why, why not to consider a third blow up? So U minus P star minus Q, does this converge to something? Okay, when Q is a solution of Signorini, th there is no way to do that, right? A solution, a generic solution, uh, um, solution with with an angle like this. But when Q is a harmonic polynomial, that you can prove that at many points Q is a harmonic polynomial, you can do that. And this is what we use to prove the C two, um, the C two continuity in dimension two, for instance. But this turns out to be very um, very useful and very important in the applications in the result that we want to apply these sort of techniques in the end, right? So here there is a slide on why, why the Signorino problem, but I will have to maybe to skip because I only have... Um, but this is a computation. Essentially you compute um, the heuristic of why you get the Signorino problem, you can do more or less easily. If someone wants to ask after the talk, I can explain. But now, some, so this, everything was for the stationary, uh, for the stationary problem, right? And that, that is a paper that all, um, with, with Alessio Figali. But then we have now a work in progress in several months. Um, and now the mathematics part is, is finished, but it's a long paper to write. I mean, it's, it's a long one. And uh, this is to, uh, John one with Alessio Figali and Xavi Rosaton, both in Zurich. One in uh, Zurich, um, Xavi is in the university. And we apply the same, so we consider the, now really the parabolic problem, the Stefan problem. And what we, and now you have, for every time, you have singular points, right? And what we prove, say it in a, a very short sentence, is that the structure theorem, we said before, essentially, this, the stratification with the optimal modulus of continuity in many points, this extends to the union. So, this set, um, so for, every, for every time, you can consider a singular point, this is a subset of Rn. But the singular set for the parabolic, you have also time, right? So this here, you project in space, and you control the union, right? That is the, the strongest control you, you could do here. The, so we can extend to the union. And as an application of this, actually, we can, th there are many extensions. So no, we just, 
is not extending the same theory, but also going to, in, in many points, you need to go to next order blow ups, what they said about the third blow up, and to prove m finer expansions. Actually, in generic points, up to order five or so is the, the critical you can, you can go. And um, what we can prove as an application is that if you are a solution of the parabolic of Stefan problem, so the, the real one, the original one, and you denote the as the set of times such that there is a singular point, so the set of, of times such that the free boundary is not analytic, this set of times has, has how the dimension less than one half. So not only for almost every t the um, that this was not known. It was not known that for almost every t um, uh, in dimension three, that is the, the physical dimension, um, not only for almost every t you don't have singular points, but also you can quantify as strong as you can say that dimension um, um, is one half, the number is one half, the host of dimension. This we don't know, of course, if it is optimal, but we can say is that we had to, to get two thirds was a bit easier, but Two, one half is critical, so many independent parts of the proof crash in the one half, so there's something there, right? And just, like, and then as a byproduct of this, you can, instead of considering, this is the, related to the question of the boundary condition, instead of considering the, um, the parabolic obstacle problem, what you can consider is just the, the classical obstacle problem, but now you, so here, so the parabolic cost of the problem, you had the heat operator here, right? Laplacian U minus dt equal characteristic function. Here you have only elliptic operator. So this, only, this operator only looks in space. So this is just a one parameter function, a family of solutions to the obstacle problem. And you assume that the boundary data are increasing, right? And with the same proof, essentially you prove um, a conjecture of Schaeffer that was proved by Mono in two dimensions, but we proved in dimension three. And we proved that for almost every value of the perimeter, that it's t, but now it's not a time, it's just a, um, um, well, a parameter, then u, the solution of this obstacle problem, is smooth. So this is like a generic, even for the elliptic obstacle problem, for generic boundary values, if you want, you have no singular points, right? Sorry. This means that my time is over. Let me just say the last, the last uh, sentence. Uh, we also can prove in both problems the, the like in the setting of the Schaeffer conjecture or of the parabolic obstacle problem, in higher dimensions, what we can prove is that for almost every time or for almost every value of the parameter, the singular set has co-dimension four. So it has dimension n minus four, right? So you, it's not bad because it's, it's almost, you prove almost the conjecture in dimension four, right? But, but of course for the application in the Stefan problems with dimension three, we are more than happy, right? Because um, it's the, the physical one. And thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Some uh, question? Not us, but um, some um, some uh, students of Alessio are are working on that. Yes. So are these uh, homogeneous solutions of the scenario problems classified? No. But you know the... In dimension two, yes. In higher dimensions, they are only classified. Um, the, so the, in dimension two, the, you have the complete classification. In dimension three... Um, Sorry, uh, who did that? Hmm? Who did that? Well, in dimension two, it's um, essentially since it's homogeneous, it's an ODE. Oh, okay. So you can, in dimension two is very easy. Dimension three, 
uh, what you can do is um, dimension reductions to go to dimension two. And apart from this, you can classify by a convexity property the solutions of homogeneity up to two. But this we never find in this application of the problem. We, all, we always are about above homogeneity two. So this classification that is the, the standard thing for the regularity in the Signorini problem, you, you cannot, it gives you nothing. And what you are interested, for instance, is the solutions of homogeneity between two and three. And an open problem already in dimension three, take a homogeneous uh, solution of Signorini. So everything is determined like by a two-dimensional cone because in dimension three the, the space um, the, the space where the context and maybe is a, a plane. So and then it is a cone. So uh, can you have a homogeneous solution of some homogeneity between two and three? This is not known. And of course in higher dimensions, even worse. <laughs> <right? laughs> Okay, thanks. Okay. How's our question? Okay, we thank the speaker again. <laughs>